section one of the book of american negro poetry this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the book of american negro poetry edited by james weldon johnson preface part one there is perhaps a better excuse for giving an anthology of american negro poetry to the public than can be offered for many of the anthologies that have recently been issued the public generally speaking does not know that there are american negro poets to supply this lack of information is alone a work worthy of somebody's effort moreover the matter of negro poets and the production of literature by the colored people in this country involves more than supplying information that is lacking it is a matter which has a direct bearing on the most vital of american problems a people may become great through many means but there is only one measure by which its greatness is recognized and acknowledged the final measure of the greatness of all peoples is the amount and standard of the literature and art they have produced the world does not know that a people is great until that people produces great literature and art no people that has produced great literature and art has ever been looked upon by the world as distinctly inferior the status of the negro in the united states is more a question of national mental attitude toward the race than of actual conditions and nothing will do more to change that mental attitude and raise his status than a demonstration of intellectual parity by the negro through the production of literature and art is there a likelihood that the american negro will be able to do this there is for the good reason that he possesses the innate powers he has the emotional endowment the originality and artistic conception and what is more important the power of creating that which has universal appeal and influence i make here what may appear to be a more startling statement by saying that the negro has already proved the possession of these powers by being the creator of the only things artistic that have yet sprung up from american soil and been universally acknowledged as distinctive american products these creations by the american negro may be summed up under four heads the first two are the uncle remus stories which were collected by joel chandler harris and the spirituals or slave songs to which the fisk jubilee singers made the public and the musicians of both the united states and europe listen the uncle remus stories constitute the greatest body of folklore that america has produced and the spirituals the greatest body of folk song i shall speak of the spirituals later because they are more than folk songs for in them the negro sounded the depths if he did not scale the heights of music the other two creations are the cakewalk and ragtime we do not need to go very far back to remember when cakewalking was the rage in the united states europe and south america society in this country and royalty abroad spent time in practising the intricate steps paris pronounced it the poetry of motion the popularity of the cake walk passed away but its influence remained the influence can be seen to-day on any american stage where there is dancing the influence which the negro has exercised on the art of dancing in this country has been almost absolute for generations the buck and wing and the stop-time dances which are strictly negro have been familiar to american theatre audiences a few years ago the public discovered the turkey trot the eagle rock ball in the jack and several other varieties that started the modern dance craze 
these dances were quickly followed by the tango a dance originated by the negroes of cuba and later transplanted to south america this fact is attested by no less authority than vincente blasco abanez in his four horsemen of the apocalypse half the floor space in the country was then turned over to dancing and highly paid exponents sprang up everywhere the most noted mr vernon castle and by the way an englishman never danced except to the music of a colored band and he never failed to state to his audiences that most of his dances had long been done by your colored people as he put it any one who witnesses a musical production in which there is dancing cannot fail to notice the negro stamp on all the movements a stamp which even the great vogue of russian dances that swept the country about the time of the popular dance craze could not affect that peculiar swaying of the shoulders which you see done everywhere by the blonde girls of the chorus is nothing more than a movement from the negro dance referred to above the eagle rock occasionally the movement takes on a suggestion of the now outlawed shimmy as for ragtime i go straight to the statement that it is the one artistic production by which america is known the world over it has been all conquering everywhere it is hailed as american music for a dozen years or so there has been a steady tendency to divorce ragtime from the negro in fact to take from him the credit of having originated it probably the younger people of the present generation do not know that ragtime is of negro origin the change wrought in ragtime and the way in which it is accepted by the country have been brought about chiefly through the change which has gradually been made in the words and stories accompanying the music once the text of all ragtime songs was written in negro dialect and was about negroes in the cabin or in the cotton field or on the levee or at a jubilee or on sixth avenue or at a ball and about their love affairs to-day only a small proportion of ragtime songs relate at all to the negro the truth is ragtime is now national rather than racial but that does not abolish in any way the claim of the american negro as its originator ragtime music was originated by colored piano players in the questionable resorts of st louis memphis and other mississippi river towns these men did not know any more about the theory of music than they did about the theory of the universe they were guided by their natural musical instinct and talent but above all by the negro's extraordinary sense of rhythm any one who is familiar with ragtime may note that its chief charm is not in melody but in rhythms these players often improvised crude and at times vulgar words to fit the music this was the beginning of the ragtime song ragtime music got its first popular hearing at chicago during the world's fair in that city from chicago it made its way to new york and then started on its universal triumph the earliest ragtime songs like topsy jess grew some of these earliest songs were taken down by white men the words slightly altered or changed and published under the names of the arrangers they sprang into immediate popularity and earned small fortunes the first to become widely known was the bully a levee song which had been long used by roustabouts along the mississippi it was introduced in new york by miss may irwin and gained instant popularity another one of these jess grew songs was one which for a while disputed for place with yankee doodle perhaps disputes it even to-day that song was a hot time in the old town to-night introduced and made popular by the colored regimental bands during the spanish-american war later there came along a number of colored men 
who were able to transcribe the old songs and write original ones i was about that time writing words to music for the music show stage in new york i was collaborating with my brother j rosamond johnson and the late bob cole i remember that we appropriated about the last one of the old jess grew songs it was a song which had been sung for years all through the south the words were unprintable but the tune was irresistible and belonged to nobody we took it rewrote the verses telling an entirely different story from the original left the chorus as it was and published the song at first under the name of will handy it became very popular with college boys especially at football games and perhaps still is the song was oh didn't he ramble in the beginning and for quite a while almost all of the ragtime songs that were deliberately composed were the work of colored writers now the colored composers even in this particular field are greatly outnumbered by the white the reader might be curious to know if the jess grew songs have ceased to grow no they have not they are growing all the time the country has lately been flooded with several varieties of the blues these blues too had their origin in memphis and the towns along the mississippi they are a sort of lament of a lover who is feeling blue over the loss of his sweetheart the blues of memphis have been adulterated so much on broadway that they have lost their pristine hue but whenever you hear a piece of music which has a strain like this in it you will know you are listening to something which belonged originally to beale avenue memphis tennessee the original memphis blues so far as it can be credited to a composer must be credited to mr w c handy a colored musician of memphis as illustrations of the genuine ragtime song in the making i quote the words of two that were popular with the southern colored soldiers in france here is the first ma mammy's lying in her grave ma daddy done run away ma sister's married a gambling man and i've done gone astray yes i've done gone astray poor boy and i've done gone astray ma sister's married a gambling man and i've done gone astray po boy these lines are crude but they contain something of real poetry of that elusive thing which nobody can define and that you can only tell that it is there when you feel it you cannot read these lines without becoming reflective and feeling sorry for po boy now take in this word picture of utter dejection i'm just as miserable as i can be i'm unhappy even if i am free i'm feeling down i'm feeling blue i wander round don't know what to do i'm going to lay my haid on de railroad line let de b and o come and pacify my mind these lines are no doubt one of the many versions of the famous blues they are also crude but they go straight to the mark the last two lines move with the swiftness of all great tragedy in spite of the bands which musicians and music teachers have placed on it the people still demand and enjoy ragtime in fact there is not a corner of the civilized world in which it is not known and liked and this proves its originality for if it were an imitation the people of europe at least would not have found it a novelty and it is proof of a more important thing it is proof that ragtime possesses the vital spark the power to appeal universally without which any artistic production no matter how approved its form may be is dead of course there are those who will deny that ragtime is an artistic production american musicians especially instead of investigating ragtime dismiss it with a contemptuous word but this has been the course of scholasticism in every branch of art whatever new thing the people like is pooh-poohed whatever is popular is regarded as not worth while the fact is nothing great or enduring in music has ever sprung full-fledged from the brain of any master 
the best he gives the world he gathers from the hearts of the people and runs it through the alembic of his genius ragtime deserves serious attention there is a lot of colourless and vicious imitation but there is enough that is genuine in one composition alone the memphis blues the musician will find not only great melodic beauty but a polyphonic structure that is amazing it is obvious that ragtime has influenced and in a large measure become our popular music but not many would know that it has influenced even our religious music those who are familiar with gospel hymns can at once see this influence if they will compare the songs of thirty years ago such as in the sweet by and by the ninety and nine etc with the up-to-date syncopated tunes that are sung in sunday schools christian endeavor societies y m c a s and like gatherings to-day ragtime has not only influenced american music it has influenced american life indeed it has saturated american life it has become the popular medium for our national expression musically and who can say that it does not express the blare and jangle and the surge too of our national spirit any one who doubts that there is a peculiar heel tickling smile provoking joy awakening response compelling charm in ragtime needs only to hear a skilful performer play the genuine article needs only to listen to its bizarre harmonies its audacious resolutions often consisting of an abrupt jump from one key to another its intricate rhythms in which the accents fall in the most unexpected places but in which the fundamental beat is never lost in order to be convinced i believe it has its place as well as the music which draws from us sighs and tears now these dances which i have referred to and ragtime music may be lower forms of art but they are evidence of a power that will some day be applied to the higher forms and even now we need not stop at the negro's accomplishment through these lower forms in the spirituals or slave songs the negro has given america not only its only folk songs but a mass of noble music i never think of this music but that i am struck by the wonder the miracle of its production how did the men who originated these songs manage to do it the sentiments are easily accounted for they are for the most part taken from the bible but the melodies where did they come from some of them so weirdly sweet and others so wonderfully strong take for instance go down moses i doubt that there is a stronger theme in the whole musical literature of the world it is to be noted that whereas the chief characteristic of ragtime is rhythm the chief characteristic of the spirituals is melody the melodies of steal away to jesus swing low sweet chariot nobody knows de trouble i see i couldn't hear nobody pray deep river o oh, freedom over me and many others of these songs possess a beauty that is what shall i say poignant in the riotous rhythms of ragtime the negro expressed his irrepressible buoyancy his keen response to the sheer joy of living in the spirituals he voiced his sense of beauty and his deep religious feeling naturally not as much can be said for the words of these songs as for the music most of the songs are religious some of them are songs expressing faith and endurance and a longing for freedom in the religious songs the sentiments and often the entire lines are taken bodily from the bible however there is no doubt that some of these religious songs have a meaning apart from the biblical text it is evident that the opening lines of go down moses go down moses way down in egypt land tell o pharaoh let my people go have a significance beyond the bondage of israel in egypt the bulk of the lines to these songs as is the case in all communal music is made up of choral iteration and incremental repetition of the leader's lines if the words are read this constant iteration and repetition are found to be tiresome 
and it must be admitted that the lines themselves are often very trite and yet there is frequently revealed a flash of real primitive poetry i give the following examples sometimes i feel like an eagle in de air you may bury me in de east you may bury me in de west but i'll hear de trumpet sound in a dat mornin i know de moonlight i know de starlight i lay dis body down i walk in de moonlight i walk in de starlight i lay dis body down i know de graveyard i know de graveyard when i lay dis body down i walk in de graveyard i walk true de graveyard to lay dis body down i lay in de grave and stretch out my arms i lay dis body down i go to de judgment in de evening of de day when i lay dis body down and my soul and yo soul will meet in de day when i lay dis body down regarding the line i lay in de grave and stretch out my arms colonel thomas wentworth higginson of boston one of the first to give these slave songs serious study said never it seems to me since man first lived and suffered was his infinite longing for peace uttered more plaintively than in that line these negro folk songs constitute a vast mine of material that has been neglected almost absolutely the only white writers who have in recent years given adequate attention and study to this music that i know of are mr h e cribbeel and mrs natalie curtis burland we have our native composers denying the worth and importance of this music and trying to manufacture grand opera out of so-called indian themes but there is a great hope for the development of this music and that hope is the negro himself a worthy beginning has already been made by burley cook johnson and Dett, and there will yet come great negro composers who will take this music and voice through it not only the soul of their race but the soul of america and does it not seem odd that this greatest gift of the negro has been the most neglected of all he possesses money and effort have been expended upon his development in every direction except this this gift has been regarded as a kind of side show something for occasional exhibition wherein it is the touchstone it is the magic thing it is that by which the negro can bridge all chasms no persons however hostile can listen to negroes singing this wonderful music without having their hostility melted down this power of the negro to suck up the national spirit from the soil and create something artistic and original which at the same time possesses the note of universal appeal is due to a remarkable racial gift of adaptability it is more than adaptability it is a transfusive quality and the negro has exercised this transfusive quality not only here in america where the race lives in large numbers but in european countries where the number has been almost infinitesimal is it not curious to know that the greatest poet of russia is alexander pushkin a man of african descent that the greatest romancer of france is alexander dumas a man of african descent and that one of the greatest musicians of england is coleridge taylor a man of african descent the fact is fairly well known that the father of dumas was a negro of the french west indies and that the father of coleridge taylor was a native-born african but the facts concerning pushkin's african ancestry are not so familiar when peter the great was czar of russia some potentate presented him with a full-blooded negro of gigantic size peter the most eccentric ruler of modern times dressed this negro up in soldier clothes christened him hannibal and made him a special bodyguard but hannibal had more than size he had brain and ability he not only looked picturesque and imposing in soldier clothes he showed that he had in him the making of a real soldier peter recognized this and eventually made him a general he afterwards ennobled him 
and hannibal later married one of the ladies of the russian court this same hannibal was great-grandfather of pushkin the national poet of russia the man who bears the same relation to russian literature that shakespeare bears to english literature i know the question naturally arises if out of the few negroes who have lived in france there came a dumas and out of the few negroes who have lived in england there came a coleridge taylor and if from the man who was at the time probably the only negro in russia there sprang that country's national poet why have not the millions of negroes in the united states with all the emotional and artistic endowment claimed for them produced a dumas or a coleridge taylor or a pushkin the question seems difficult but there is an answer the negro in the united states is consuming all of his intellectual energy in this gruelling race struggle and the same statement may be made in a general way about the white south why does not the white south produce literature and art the white south too is consuming all of its intellectual energy in this lamentable conflict nearly all of the mental efforts of the white south run through one narrow channel the life of every southern white man and all of his activities are impassably limited by the ever-present negro problem and that is why as mr h l mencken puts it in all that vast region with its thirty or forty million people and its territory as large as a half a dozen frances or germanys there is not a single poet not a serious historian not a creditable composer not a critic good or bad not a dramatist dead or alive but even so the american negro has accomplished something in pure literature the list of those who have done so would be surprising both by its length and the excellence of the achievements one of the great books written in this country since the civil war is the work of a colored man the souls of black folk by w e b du bois such a list begins with phyllis wheatley in seventeen sixty one a slave ship landed a cargo of slaves in boston among them was a little girl seven or eight years of age she attracted the attention of john wheatley a wealthy gentleman of boston who purchased her as a servant for his wife mrs wheatley was a benevolent woman she noticed the girl's quick mind and determined to give her opportunity for its development twelve years later phyllis published a volume of poems the book was brought out in london where phyllis was for several months an object of great curiosity and attention phyllis wheatley has never been given her rightful place in american literature by some sort of conspiracy she is kept out of most of the books especially the textbooks on literature used in the schools of course she is not a great american poet and in her day there were no great american poets but she is an important american poet her importance if for no other reason rests on the fact that save one she is the first in order of time of all the women poets of america and she is among the first of all american poets to issue a volume it seems strange that the books generally give space to a mention of urian oakes president of harvard college and to quotations from the crude and lengthy elegy which he published in sixteen sixty seven and print examples from the execrable versified version of the psalms made by the new england divines and yet deny a place to phyllis wheatley here are the opening lines from the elegy by oakes which is quoted from in most of the books on american literature reader i am no poet but i grieve behold here what that passion can do that forced a verse without apollo's leave and whether the learned sisters would or no there was no need for urian to admit what his handiwork declared but this from the versified psalms is still worse yet it is found in the books the lord's song sing can we being in strangers land then let loose her skill my right hand if i jerusalem forget anne bradstreet preceded phyllis wheatley by a little over twenty years 
she published her volume of poems the tenth muse in seventeen fifty let us strike a comparison between the two anne bradstreet was a wealthy cultivated puritan girl the daughter of thomas dudley governor of bay colony phyllis as we know was a negro slave girl born in africa let us take them both at their best and in the same vein the following stanza is from anne's poem entitled contemplation while musing thus with contemplation fed and thousand fancies buzzing in my brain the sweet-tongued philomel perched o'er my head and chanted forth a most melodious strain which wrapped me so with wonder and delight i judged my hearing better than my sight and wished me wings with her a while to take my flight and the following is from phyllis poem entitled imagination imagination who can sing thy force or who describe the swiftness of thy course soaring through air to find the bright abode the imperial palace of the thundering god we on thy pinions can surpass the wind and leave the rolling universe behind from star to star the mental optics rove measure the skies and range the realms above there in one view we grasp the mighty whole or with new worlds amaze the unbounded soul we do not think the black woman suffers much by comparison with the white thomas jefferson said of phyllis religion has produced a phyllis wheatley but it could not produce a poet her poems are beneath contempt it is quite likely that jefferson's criticism was directed more against religion than against phyllis poetry on the other hand general george washington wrote her with his own hand a letter in which he thanked her for a poem which she had dedicated to him he later received her with marked courtesy at his camp at cambridge it appears certain that phyllis was the first person to apply to george washington the phrase first in peace the phrase occurs in her poem addressed to his excellency general george washington written in seventeen seventy five the encomium first in war first in peace first in the hearts of his countrymen was originally used in the resolutions presented to congress on the death of washington december seventeen ninety nine phyllis wheatley's poetry is the poetry of the eighteenth century she wrote when pope and gray were supreme it is easy to see that pope was her model had she come under the influence of wordsworth byron or keats or shelley she would have done greater work as it is her work must not be judged by the work and standards of a later day but by the work and standards of her own day and her own contemporaries by this method of criticism she stands out as one of the important characters in the making of american literature without any allowances for her sex or her antecedents according to a bibliographical checklist of american negro poetry compiled by mr arthur a schomburg more than one hundred negroes in the united states have published volumes of poetry ranging in size from pamphlets to books of from one hundred to three hundred pages about thirty of these writers fill in the gap between phyllis wheatley and paul lawrence dunbar just here it is of interest to note that a negro wrote and published a poem before phyllis wheatley arrived in this country from africa he was jupiter hammond a slave belonging to a mr lloyd of queen's village long island in seventeen sixty hammond published a poem eighty-eight lines in length entitled an evening thought salvation by christ with penitential cries in seventeen eighty eight he published an address to miss phyllis wheatley ethiopian poetess in boston who came from africa at eight years of age and soon became acquainted with the gospel of jesus christ these two poems do not include all that hammond wrote the poets between phyllis wheatley and dunbar must be considered more in the light of what they attempted than of what they accomplished many of them showed marked talent but barely a half dozen of them demonstrated even mediocre mastery of technique and the use of poetic material and forms and yet there are several names that deserve mention george m horton francis e harper 
james m bell and albury a whitman all merit consideration when due allowances are made for their limitations in education training and general culture the limitations of horton were greater than those of either of the others he was born a slave in north carolina in seventeen ninety seven and as a young man began to compose poetry without being able to write it down later he received some instruction from professors of the university of north carolina at which institution he was employed as a janitor he published a volume of poems the hope of liberty in eighteen twenty nine mrs harper bell and whitman would stand out if only for the reason that each of them attempted sustained work mrs harper published her first volume of poems in eighteen fifty four but later she published moses a story of the nile a poem which ran to fifty-two closely printed pages bell in eighteen sixty four published a poem of twenty-eight pages in celebration of president lincoln's emancipation proclamation in eighteen seventy he published a poem of thirty-two pages in celebration of the ratification of the fifteenth amendment to the constitution whitman published his first volume of poems a book of two hundred and fifty three pages in eighteen seventy seven but in eighteen eighty four he published the rape of florida an epic poem written in four cantos and done in the spenserian stanza and which ran to ninety seven closely printed pages the poetry of both mrs harper and of whitman had a large degree of popularity one of mrs harper's books went through more than twenty editions of these four poets it is whitman who reveals not only the greatest imagination but also the more skilful workmanship his lyric power at its best may be judged from the following stanza from the rape of florida come now my love the moon is on the lake upon the waters is my light canoe come with me love and gladsome oars shall make a music on the parting wave for you come o'er the waters deep and dark and blue come where the lilies in the marge have sprung come with me love for o oh, my love is true this is the song that on the lake was sung the boatman sang it when his heart was young some idea of whitman's capacity for dramatic narration may be gained from the following lines taken from not a man and yet a man a poem of even greater length than the rape of florida a flash of steely lightning from his hand strikes down the groaning leader of the band divides his startled comrades and again descending leaves fair dora's captors slain her seizing them within a strong embrace out in the dark he wheels his flying pace he speaks not but with stalwart tenderness her swelling bosom firm to his doth press springs like a stag that flees the eager hound and like a whirlwind rustles o'er the ground her locks swim in dishevelled wildness o'er his shoulders streaming to his waist and more while on and on strong as a rolling flood his sweeping footsteps part the silent wood it is curious and interesting to trace the growth of individuality and race consciousness in this group of poets jupiter hammond's verses were almost entirely religious exhortations only very seldom does phyllis wheatley sound a native note four times in single lines she refers to herself as afric's muse in a poem of admonition addressed to the students at the university of cambridge in new england she refers to herself as follows ye blooming plants of human race divine an ethiop tells you tis your greatest foe but one looks in vain for some outburst or even complaint against the bondage of her people for some agonizing cry about her native land in two poems she refers definitely to africa as her home but in each instance there seems to be under the sentiment of the lines a feeling of almost smug contentment at her own escape therefrom in the poem on being brought from africa to america she says twas mercy brought me from my pagan land taught my benighted soul to understand that there's a god and there's a saviour too once i redemption neither sought or knew some view our sable race with scornful eye their colour is a diabolic dye remember christians negroes black as cane may be refined and joined angelic train 
in the poem addressed to the earl of dartmouth she speaks of freedom and makes a reference to the parents from whom she was taken as a child a reference which cannot but strike the reader as rather unimpassioned should you my lord while you peruse my song wonder from whence my love of freedom sprung whence flow these wishes for the common good by feeling hearts alone best understood i young in life by seeming cruel fate was snatched from afric's fancied happy seat what pangs excruciating must molest what sorrows labour in my parents breast steeled was that soul and by no misery moved that from a father seized his babe beloved such such my case and can i then but pray others may never feel tyrannic sway the bulk of phyllis wheatley's work consists of poems addressed to people of prominence her book was dedicated to the countess of huntington at whose house she spent the greater part of her time while in england on his repeal of the stamp act she wrote a poem to king george the third whom she saw later another poem she wrote to the earl of dartmouth whom she knew a number of her verses were addressed to other persons of distinction indeed it is apparent that phyllis was far from being a democrat she was far from being a democrat not only in her social ideas but also in her political ideas unless a religious meaning is given to the closing lines of her ode to general washington she was a decided royalist a crown a mansion and a throne that shine with gold and fading washington be thine nevertheless she was an ardent patriot her ode to general washington seventeen seventy five her spirited poem on major general lee seventeen seventy six and her poem liberty and peace written in celebration of the close of the war reveal not only strong patriotic feeling but an understanding of the issues at stake in her poem on major general lee she makes her hero reply thus to the taunts of the british commander into whose hands he has been delivered through treachery o oh, arrogance of tongue and wild ambition ever prone to wrong believest thou chief that armies such as thine can stretch in dust that heaven defended line in vain allies may swarm from distant lands and demons aid in formidable bands great as thou art thou shunst the field of fame disgrace to britain and the british name when offered combat by the noble foe foe to misrule why did the sword forego the easy conquest of the rebel land perhaps too easy for thy martial hand what various causes to the field invite for plunder you and we for freedom fight her cause divine with generous ardor fires and every bosom glows as she inspires already thousands of your troops have fled to the drear mansions of the silent dead columbia too beholds with streaming eyes her heroes fall tis freedom's sacrifice so wills the power who with convulsive storms shakes impious realms and nature's face deforms yet those brave troops and numerous as the sands one soul inspires one general chief commands find in your train of boasted heroes one to match the praise of godlike washington thrice happy chief in whom the virtues join and heaven taught prudence speaks the man divine what phyllis wheatley failed to achieve is due in no small degree to her education and environment her mind was steeped in the classics her verses are filled with classical and mythological allusions she knew ovid thoroughly and was familiar with other latin authors she must have known alexander pope by heart and too she was reared and sheltered in a wealthy and cultured family a wealthy and cultured boston family she never had the opportunity to, to learn life she never found out her own true relation to life and to her surroundings and it should not be forgotten that she was only about thirty years old when she died the impulsion or the compulsion that might have driven her genius off the worn paths out on a journey of exploration phyllis wheatley never received but whatever her limitations she merits more than america has accorded her horton who was born three years after phyllis wheatley's death expressed in all of his poetry strong complaint at his condition of slavery and a deep longing for freedom the following verses are typical of his style and his ability alas and am i born for this to wear this slavish chain deprived of all created bliss through hardship toil and pain 
come liberty thou cheerful sound roll through my ravished ears come let my grief in joys be drowned and drive away my fears in mrs harper we find something more than the complaint and the longing of horton we find an expression of a sense of wrong and injustice the following stanzas are from a poem addressed to the white women of america you can sigh o'er the sad-eyed armenian who weeps in her desolate home you can mourn o'er the exile of russia from kindred and friends doomed to roam but hark from our southland are floating sobs of anguish murmurs of pain and women heart-stricken are weeping o'er their tortured and slain have ye not o oh my favourite sisters just a plea a prayer or a tear for mothers who dwell neath the shadows of agony hatred and fear weep not o oh my well-sheltered sisters weep not for the negro alone but weep for your sons who must gather the crops which their fathers have sown whitman in the midst of the rape of florida a poem in which he related the taking of the state of florida from the seminoles stops and discusses the race question he discusses it in many other poems and he discusses it from many different angles in whitman we find not only an expression of a sense of wrong and injustice but we hear a note of faith and a note also of defiance for example in the opening to canto two of the rape of florida greatness by nature cannot be entailed it is an office ending with the man sage hero saviour though the sire be hailed the sun may reach obscurity in the van sublime achievements no no patent plan man's immortality is a book with seals and none but god shall open none else can but open it the mystery reveals manhood's conquest of man to heaven's respect appeals is manhood less because man's face is black let thunders of the loosened seals reply who shall the rider's restive steed turn back or who withstand the arrows he lets fly between the mountains of eternity genius ride forth thou gift and torch of heaven the mastery is kindled in thine eye to conquest ride thy bow of strength is given the trampled hordes if cast before thee shall be driven tis hard to judge if hatred of one's race by those who deem themselves superior born be worse than that quiescence in disgrace which only merits and should only scorn oh let me see the negro night and morn pressing and fighting in for place and power all earth is place all time the auspicious hour while heaven leans forth to look or will he quail or cower ah i abhor his protest and complaint his pious looks and patience i despise he can't evade the test disguised as saint the manly voice of freedom bids him rise and shake himself before philistine eyes and like a lion roused no sooner than a foe dare come play all his energies and court the fray with fury if he can for hell itself respects a fearless manly man it may be said that none of these poets strike a deep native strain or sound a distinctively original note either in matter or form that is true but the same thing may be said of all the american poets down to the writers of the present generation with the exception of poe and walt whitman the thing in which these black poets are mostly excelled by their contemporaries is mere technique End of section one section two of the book of american negro poetry this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the book of american negro poetry edited by james weldon johnson preface part two paul lawrence dunbar stands out as the first poet from the negro race in the united states to show a combined mastery over poetic material and poetic technique to reveal innate literary distinction in what he wrote and to maintain a high level of performance 
he was the first to rise to a height from which he could take a perspective view of his own race he was the first to see objectively its humour its superstitions its shortcomings the first to feel sympathetically its heart wounds its yearnings its aspirations and to voice them all in a purely literary form dunbar's fame rests chiefly on his poems in negro dialect this appraisal of him is no doubt fair for in these dialect poems he not only carried his art to the highest point of perfection but he made a contribution to american literature unlike what any one else had made a contribution which perhaps no one else could have made of course negro dialect poetry was written before dunbar wrote most of it by white writers but the fact stands out that dunbar was the first to use it as a medium for the true interpretation of negro character and psychology and yet dialect poetry does not constitute the whole or even the bulk of dunbar's work in addition to a large number of poems of a very high order done in literary english he was the author of four novels and several volumes of short stories indeed dunbar did not begin his career as a writer of dialect i may be pardoned for introducing here a bit of reminiscence my personal friendship with paul dunbar began before he had achieved recognition and continued to be close until his death when i first met him he had published a thin volume oak and ivy which was being sold chiefly through his own efforts oak and ivy showed no distinctive negro influence but rather the influence of james whitcomb riley at this time paul and i were together every day for several months he talked to me a great deal about his hopes and ambitions in these talks he revealed that he had reached a realization of the possibilities of poetry in the dialect together with a recognition of the fact that it offered the surest way by which he could get a hearing often he said to me i've got to write dialect poetry it's the only way i can get them to listen to me i was with dunbar at the beginning of what proved to be his last illness he said to me then i have not grown i am writing the same things i wrote ten years ago and am writing them no better his self-accusation was not fully true he had grown and he had gained a sure control of his art but he had not accomplished the greater things of which he was constantly dreaming the public had held him to the things for which it had accorded him recognition if dunbar had lived he would have achieved some of those dreams but even while he talked so dejectedly to me he seemed to feel that he was not to live he died when he was only thirty-three it has a bearing on this entire subject to note that dunbar was of unmixed negro blood so as the greatest figure in literature which the colored race in the united states has produced he stands as an example at once refuting and confounding those who wish to believe that whatever extraordinary ability the afro-americans shows is due to an admixture of white blood as a man dunbar was kind and tender in conversation he was brilliant and polished his voice was his chief charm and was a great element in his success as a reader of his own works in his actions he was impulsive as a child sometimes even erratic indeed his intimate friends almost looked upon him as a spoiled boy he was always delicate in health temperamentally he belonged to that class of poets who taine says are vessels too weak to contain the spirit of poetry the poets whom poetry kills 
the byrons the burnses the de Mousses, the poes to whom may he be compared this boy who scribbled his early verses while he ran an elevator whose youth was a battle against poverty and who in spite of almost insurmountable obstacles rose to success a comparison between him and burns is not unfitting the similarity between many phases of their lives is remarkable and their works are not incommensurable burns took the strong dialect of his people and made it classic dunbar took the humble speech of his people and in it wrought music mention of dunbar brings up for consideration the fact that although he is the most outstanding figure in literature among the afro-americans of the united states he does not stand alone among the afro-americans of the whole western world there are placido and manzano in cuba vieux and durand in haiti machado de assi in brazil leon lavio in martinique and others still that might be mentioned who stand on a plane with or even above dunbar placido and machado de assi rank as great in the literatures of their respective countries without any qualifications whatever they are world figures in the literature of the latin languages machado de assi is somewhat handicapped in this respect by having as his tongue and medium the lesser-known portuguese the placido writing in the language of spain mexico cuba and of almost the whole of south america is universally known his works have been republished in the original in spain mexico and in most of the latin american countries several editions have been published in the united states translations of his works have been made into french and german placido is in some respects the greatest of all the cuban poets in sheer genius and the fire of inspiration he surpasses even the more finished heredia then too his birth his life and his death ideally contain the tragic elements that go into the making of a halo about a poet's head placido was born in habana in eighteen hundred and nine the first months of his life were passed in a foundling asylum indeed his real name gabriel de la concepcion valdez was in honor of its founder his father took him out of the asylum but shortly afterwards went to mexico and died there his early life was a struggle against poverty his youth and manhood was a struggle for cuban independence his death placed him in the list of cuban martyrs on the twenty seventh of june eighteen forty four he was lined up against a wall with ten others and shot by order of the spanish authorities on a charge of conspiracy in his short but eventful life he turned out work which bulks more than six hundred pages during the few hours preceding his execution he wrote three of his best-known poems among them his famous sonnet mother farewell placido's sonnet to his mother has been translated into every important language william cullen bryant did it in english but in spite of its wide popularity it is perhaps outside of cuba the least understood of all placido's poems it is curious to note how bryant's translation totally misses the intimate sense of the delicate subtlety of the poem the american poet makes it a tender and loving farewell of a son who is about to die to a heartbroken mother but that is not the kind of a farewell that placido intended to write or did write the key to the poem is in the first word and the first word is the spanish conjunction si if the central idea then of the sonnet is if the sad fate which now overwhelms me should bring a pang to your heart do not weep for i die a glorious death and sound the last note of my lyre to you 
bryant either failed to understand or ignored the opening word if because he was not familiar with the poet's history while placido's father was a negro his mother was a spanish white woman a dancer in one of the habana theatres at his birth she abandoned him to a foundling asylum and perhaps never saw him again although it is known that she outlived her son when the poet came down to his last hours he remembered that somewhere there lived a woman who was his mother that although she had heartlessly abandoned him that although he owed her no filial duty still she might perhaps on hearing of his sad end feel some pang of grief or sadness so he tells her in his last words that he dies happy and bids her not to weep this he does with nobility and dignity but absolutely without affection taking into account these facts and especially their humiliating and embittering effect upon a soul so sensitive as placido's this sonnet in spite of the obvious weakness of the sestet as compared with the octave is a remarkable piece of work in considering the afro-american poets of the latin languages i am impelled to think that as up to this time the colored poets of greater universality have come out of the latin american countries rather than out of the united states they will continue to do so for a good many years the reason for this i hinted at in the first part of this preface the colored poet in the united states labors within limitations which he cannot easily pass over he is always on the defensive or the offensive the pressure upon him to be propagandic is well nigh irresistible these conditions are suffocating to breadth and to real art in poetry in addition he labors under the handicap of finding culture not entirely colorless in the united states on the other hand the colored poet of latin america can voice the national spirit without any reservations and he will be rewarded without any reservations whether it be to place him among the great or declare him the greatest so i think it probable that the first world acknowledged afro-american poet will come out of latin america over against this probability of course is the great advantage possessed by the colored poet in the united states of writing in the world conquering english language this preface has gone far beyond what i had in mind when i started it was my intention to gather together the best verses i could find by negro poets and present them with a bare word of introduction it was not my plan to make this collection inclusive nor to make the book in any sense a book of criticism i planned to present only verses by contemporary writers but perhaps because this is the first collection of its kind i realized the absence of a starting point and was led to provide one and to fill in with historical data what i feel to be a gap it may be surprising to many to see how little of the poetry being written by negro poets to-day is being written in negro dialect the newer negro poets show a tendency to discard dialect much of the subject matter which went into the making of traditional dialect poetry possums watermelons etc they have discarded altogether at least as poetic material this tendency will no doubt be regretted by the majority of white readers and indeed it would be a distinct loss if the american negro poets threw away this quaint and musical folk speech as a medium of expression and yet after all these poets are working through a problem not realized by the reader and perhaps by many of these poets themselves not realized consciously they are trying to break away from not negro dialect itself but the limitations on negro dialect imposed by the fixing effects of long convention the negro in the united states has achieved or been placed in a certain artistic niche 
when he is thought of artistically it is as a happy-go-lucky singing shuffling banjo-picking being or as a more or less pathetic figure the picture of him is in a log cabin amid fields of cotton or along the levees negro dialect is naturally and by long association the exact instrument for voicing this phase of negro life and by that very exactness it is an instrument with but two full stops humour and pathos so even when he confines himself to purely racial themes the afro-american poet realizes that there are phases of negro life in the united states which cannot be treated in the dialect either adequately or artistically take for example the phases rising out of life in harlem that most wonderful negro city in the world i do not deny that a negro in a log cabin is more picturesque than a negro in a harlem flat but the negro in the harlem flat is here and he is but part of a group growing everywhere in the country a group whose ideals are becoming increasingly more vital than those of the traditionally artistic group even if its members are less picturesque what the colored poet in the united states needs to do is something like what singe did for the irish he needs to find a form that will express the racial spirit by symbols from within rather than by symbols from without such as the mere mutilation of english spelling and pronunciation he needs a form that is freer and larger than dialect but which will still hold the racial flavor a form expressing the imagery the idioms the peculiar turns of thought and the distinctive humor and pathos too of the negro but which will also be capable of voicing the deepest and highest emotions and aspirations and allow of the widest range of subjects and the widest scope of treatment negro dialect is at present a medium that is not capable of giving expression to the varied conditions of negro life in america and much less is it capable of giving the fullest interpretation of negro character and psychology this is no indictment against the dialect as dialect but against the mould of convention in which negro dialect in the united states has been set in time these conventions may become lost and the colored poet in the united states may sit down to write in dialect without feeling that his first line will put the general reader in a frame of mind which demands that the poem be humorous or pathetic in the meantime there is no reason why these poets should not continue to do the beautiful things that can be done and done best in the dialect in stating the need for afro-american poets in the united states to work out a new and distinctive form of expression i do not wish to be understood to hold any theory that they should limit themselves to negro poetry to racial themes the sooner they are able to write american poetry spontaneously the better nevertheless i believe that the richest contribution the negro poet can make to the american literature of the future will be the fusion into it of his own individual artistic gifts not many of the writers here included except dunbar are known at all to the general reading public and there is only one of these who has a widely recognized position in the american literary world he is william stanley braithwaite mr braithwaite is not only unique in this respect but he stands unique among all the afro-american writers the united states has yet produced he has gained his place taking as the standard and measure for his work the identical standard and measure applied to american writers and american literature he is asked for no allowances or rewards either directly or indirectly on account of his race mr braithwaite is the author of two volumes of verses lyrics of delicate and tenuous beauty in his more recent and uncollected poems he shows himself more and more decidedly the mystic 
but his place in american literature is due more to his work as a critic and anthologist than to his work as a poet there is still another role he has played that of friend of poetry and poets it is a recognized fact that in the work which preceded the present revival of poetry in the united states no one rendered more unremitting and valuable service than mr braithwaite and it can be said that no future study of american poetry of this age can be made without reference to braithwaite two authors included in the book are better known for their work in prose than in poetry w e b du bois whose well-known prose at its best is however impassioned and rhythmical and benjamin brawley who is the author among other works of one of the best handbooks on the english drama that has yet appeared in america but the group of the new negro poets whose work makes up the bulk of this anthology contains names destined to be known claude mckay although still quite a young man has already demonstrated his power breadth and skill as a poet mr mckay's breadth is as essential a part of his equipment as his power and skill he demonstrates mastery of the three when as a negro poet he pours out the bitterness and rebellion in his heart in those two sonnet tragedies if we must die and to the white fiends in a manner that strikes terror and when as a cosmic poet he creates the atmosphere and mood of poetic beauty in the absolute as he does in spring in new hampshire and the harlem dancer mr mckay gives evidence that he has passed beyond the danger which threatens many of the new negro poets the danger of allowing the purely polemical phases of the race problem to choke their sense of artistry mr mckay's earliest work is unknown in this country it consists of poems written and published in his native jamaica i was fortunate enough to run across this first volume and i could not refrain from reproducing here one of the poems written in the west indian negro dialect i have done this not only to illustrate the widest range of the poet's talent and to offer a comparison between the american and the west indian dialects but on account of the intrinsic worth of the poem itself i was much tempted to introduce several more in spite of the fact that they might require a glossary because however greater work mr mckay may do he can never do anything more touching and charming than these poems in the jamaica dialect fenton johnson is a young poet of the ultra modern school who gives promise of greater work than he has yet done jesse fawcett shows that she possesses the lyric gift and she works with care and finish miss fawcett is especially adept in her translations from the french georgia douglas johnson is a poet neither afraid nor ashamed of her emotions she limits herself to the purely conventional forms rhythms and rhymes but through them she achieves striking effects the principal theme of mrs johnson's poems is the secret dread down in every woman's heart the dread of the passing of youth and beauty and with them love an old theme one which poets themselves have often wearied of but which like death remains one of the imperishable themes on which is made the poetry that has moved men's hearts through all ages in her ingenuously wrought verses through sheer simplicity and spontaneousness mrs johnson often sounds a note of pathos or passion that will not fail to waken a response except in those too sophisticated or cynical to respond to natural impulses of the half-dozen or so of colored women writing creditable verse and spencer is the most modern and least obvious in her methods her lines are at times involved and turgid and almost cryptic but she shows an originality which does not depend upon eccentricities in her before the feast of shushan she displays an opulence the love of which 
has long been charged against the negro as one of his naive and childish traits but which in art may infuse a much-needed color warmth and spirit of abandon into american poetry john w holloway more than any negro poet writing in the dialect to-day summons to his work the lilt the spontaneity and charm of which dunbar was the supreme master whenever he employed that medium it is well to say a word here about the dialect poems of james edwin campbell in dialect campbell was a precursor of dunbar a comparison of his idioms and phonetics with those of dunbar reveals great differences dunbar is a shade or two more sophisticated and his phonetics approach nearer to a mean standard of the dialect spoken in the different sections campbell is more primitive and his phonetics are those of the dialect as spoken by the negroes of the sea islands off the coasts of south carolina and georgia which to this day remains comparatively close to its african roots and is strikingly similar to the speech of the uneducated negroes of the west indies an error that confuses many persons in reading or understanding negro dialect is the idea that it is uniform an ignorant negro of the uplands of georgia would have almost as much difficulty in understanding an ignorant sea island negro as an englishman would have not even in the dialect of any particular section is a given word always pronounced in precisely the same way its pronunciation depends upon the preceding and following sounds sometimes the combination permits of a liaison so close that to the uninitiated the sound of the word is almost completely lost the constant effort in negro dialect is to elide all troublesome consonants and sounds this negative effort may be after all only positive laziness of the vocal organs but the result is a softening and smoothing which makes negro dialect so delightfully easy for singers daniel webster davis wrote dialect poetry at the time when dunbar was writing he gained great popularity but it did not spread beyond his own race davis had unctuous humor but he was crude for illustration note the vast stretch between his hog meat and dunbar's when de cone pones hot both of them poems on the traditional ecstasy of the negro in contemplation of good things to eat it is regrettable that two of the most gifted writers included were cut off so early in life r c jameson and joseph s cotter jr died several years ago both of them in their youth jameson was barely thirty at the time of his death but among his poems there is one at least which stamps him as a poet of superior talent and lofty inspiration the negro soldiers is a poem with the race problem as its theme yet it transcends the limits of race and rises to a spiritual height that makes it one of the noblest poems of the great war cotter died a mere boy of twenty and the latter part of that brief period he passed in an invalid state some months before his death he published a thin volume of verses which were for the most part written on a sick-bed in this little volume cotter showed fine poetic sense and a free and bold mastery over his material a reading of cotter's poems is certain to induce that mood in which one will regretfully speculate on what the young poet might have accomplished had he not been cut off so soon as intimated above my original idea for this book underwent a change in the writing of the introduction i first planned to select twenty-five to thirty poems which i judged to be up to a certain standard and offer them with a few words of introduction and without comment in the collection as it grew to be that certain standard had been broadened if not lowered but i believe that this is offset by the advantage of the wider range given the reader and the student of the subject i offer this collection without making apology or asking allowance i feel confident that the reader will find not only an earnest for the future but actual achievement the reader cannot but be impressed by the distance already covered it is a long way from the plaints of george horton to the invectives of claude mckay from the obviousness of francis harper to the complexness of ann spencer much ground has been covered but more will yet be covered 
it is this side of prophecy to declare that the undeniable creative genius of the negro is destined to make a distinctive and valuable contribution to american poetry i wish to extend my thanks to mr arthur a schomburg who placed his valuable collection of books by negro authors at my disposal i wish also to acknowledge with thanks the kindness of dodd mead and company for permitting the reprint of poems by paul lawrence dunbar of the cornhill publishing company for permission to reprint poems of georgia douglas johnson joseph s cotter jr bertram johnson and waverley carmichael and of neal and company for permission to reprint poems of john w holloway i wish to thank mr braithwaite for permission to use the included poems from his forthcoming volume sandy star and willie g and to acknowledge the courtesy of the following magazines the crisis the century magazine the liberator the freeman the independent others and poetry a magazine of verse james weldon johnson new york city nineteen twenty one end of section two Section 3 of the Book of American Negro Poetry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Book of American Negro Poetry. Edited by James Weldon Johnson section three paul lawrence dunbar a negro love song one seen my lady home last night jump back honey jump back hell ha hen and squeeze it tight jump back honey jump back hit ha sigh a little sigh seen a light gleam from her eye and a smile go flittin by jump back honey jump back heard de wind blow through de pine jump back honey jump back mockin bird was singin fine jump back honey jump back and my heart was beatin so when i reached my lady's stall dat i couldn't but to go jump back honey jump back put my arm around her waist jump back honey jump back raised her lips and took a taste jump back honey jump back love me honey love me true love me well as i love you and she answered cause i do jump back honey jump back footnote one copyright by dodd mead and company and footnote little brown baby little brown baby with sparkling eyes come to ya poppy and set on his knee what ya be doin sure makin sand pies look at dat bib use duty is me look at dat mouth dat's mer lasses i bet come here maria and wipe off his hands bis gwine to catch you and eat you up it been so sticky and sweet goodness lands little brown baby with sparkling eyes who's pappy darlin and who's pappy chill who is it all de day never once tries for to be cross er once loses dat smile what did ye get dem teeth my yours a scamp what did dat dimple come from in yer chin poppy don't know you i believes you a tramp mommy dis here's some old straggler got in let's throw em outen de dew in the sand 
we do want stragglers a lyin round here let's gin him way to de big booger man i know he's hidin around here right now booger man booger man come in de door he is a bad boy you can have fun to eat mommy and poppy do want him no more swaller him down from his head to his feet da now i thought dat you'd hug me up close go back o oh bugger you shan't have dis boy he ain't no tramp ner no struggler o oh course he's poppy's partner and playmate o joy come to you pallet now go to ye rest wish you could always know is an clear skies wish you could stay just a chill on my breast little brown baby with a sparklin eyes ships that pass in the night out in the sky the great dark clouds are massing i look far out into the pregnant night where i can hear a solemn booming gun and catch the gleaming of a random light that tells me that the ship i seek is passing passing my tearful eyes my soul's deep hurt are glassing for i would hail and check that ship of ships i stretch my hands imploring cry out loud my voice falls dead a foot from mine own lips and but its ghost doth reach that vessel passing passing o earth o sky o ocean both surpassing o heart of mine o soul that dreads the dark is there no hope for me is there no way that i may sight and check that speeding bark which out of sight and sound is passing passing lover's lane summer night and sighing breeze long de lover's lane friendly shatter making trees long de lover's lane white folks walk all done up grand me and maddie han and han strutting that we own de lin long de lover's lane all a setting side de road long de lover's lane looking at us lack he nude dis us lover's lane go on hoot ye mournful tune you ain't never loved in june and come hidin from de moon down in lover's lane bush it bin and nod as way down in lover's lane trying to hear ye me what i say long de lover's lane but i whisper low like dis and my mandy smile her bliss mr bush he shack his fist down in lover's lane what i care if days long down in lover's lane i can always sing a song long de lover's lane and de words i hear a and say meeks up full de weary day when i strollin by de way down in lover's lane and dis ought will always rise down in lover's lane wonder with a uh, in disguise day's a lovely lane ef de ain't i'll tell you true lake on do look mighty blue cause i dunno what i do doubt a lover's lane the debt this is the debt i pay just for one riotous day years of regret and grief 
sorrow without relief pay it i will to the end until the grave my friend gives me a true release gives me the clasp of peace slight was the thing i brought small was the debt i thought poor was the loan at best god but the interest the haunted oak pray why are you so bare so bare o bough of the old oak tree and why when i go through the shade you throw runs a shudder over me my leaves were green as the best i trow and sap ran free in my veins but i saw in the moonlight dim and weird a guiltless victim's pains i bent me down to hear his sigh i shook with his gurgling moan and i trembled sore when they rode away and left him here alone they charged him with the old old crime and set him fast in jail oh why does the dog howl all night long and why does the night wind wail he prayed his prayer and he swore his oath and he raised his hand to the sky but the beat of hooves smote on his ear and the steady tread drew nigh who is it rides by day by night over the moonlit road and what is the spur that keeps the pace what is the galling goad and now they beat at the prison door ho keeper do not stay we are friends of him whom you hold within and we fain would take him away from those who ride fast on our heels with mine to do him wrong they have no care for his innocence and the rope they bear is long they have fooled the jailer with lying words they have fooled the man with lies the bolts unbar the locks are drawn and the great door open flies now they have taken him from the jail and hard and fast they ride and the leader laughs low down in his throat as they halt my trunk beside oh the judge he wore a mask of black and the doctor one of white and the minister with his oldest son with curiosity be dight o oh, foolish man why weep you now tis but a little space and the time will come when these shall dread the memory of your face i feel the rope against my bark and the weight of him in my grain i feel in the throe of his final woe the touch of my own last pain and never more shall leaves come forth on a bough that bears the ban i am burned with dread i am dried and dead from the curse of a guiltless man and ever the judge rides by rides by and goes to hunt the deer and ever another rides his soul in the guise of a mortal fear and ever the man he rides me hard and never a night stays he for i feel his curse as a haunted bough on the trunk of a haunted tree when the con ponds hot day is times in life when nature seems to slip a cog and go just a rattling down creation lack and oceans overflow when the world just stands a spinnin like a pickaninny's top and ye cup o oh joy is brimmin twelve it seems about to stop and ye feel just lack a racka 
dat is training for to trot when ya mammy says de blessing and de cons pawns hot when you set down at de table kin o weary lack and said and you's just a little tired and perhaps a little mad how your gloom turns into gladness how your joy drives out the doubt when the oven door is opened and the smell comes pawn out why the electric light of heaven seems to settle on the spot when your mammy says the blessing and the corn pawns hot when the cabbage pot is steaming and the bacon good and fat when the chitlins is a sputtin so to show you what they's at take away your soddy biscuit take away your cake and pie fur de glory time is comin and it's proaching mighty nigh and you want to jump and holla do you know you'd better not when your mammy is saying the blessing and the con pawns hot i have heard o oh, lots of sermons i have heard o oh, lots of prayers and i listen to some singin dat has tuck me upstairs of de glory land and set me jesus blow de master's throne and have left my heart a singin in a happy aftertone but dem words so sweetly murmured seems to tech de softest spot when my mammy says de blessin as de corn pots hot a death song lay me down beneath the willers in de grass what de branch shall go a singing as it pass and when it's a laying low i can hear it as it go singing sleep my honey tech your rest at last lay me nigh to wa hit meeks a little pool and de wa stands so quiet lack and cold wa de little birds in spring used to come and drink and sing and de chillin waited on de way to school let me settle when my shoulders drapes de load night enough to hear a de noises in de road for i think de last long rest one to soothe my spirit best if i's layin among de things i always knowed end of section three recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Section 4 of The Book of American Negro Poetry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Khalil B. The Book of American Negro Poetry. Edited by James Weldon Johnson. Section 4 james edwin campbell negro serenade oh the light bugs glimmer down the lane melindy melindy oh the whip will callin' notes your pain melindy oh melindy oh honey love my turkle dub don't you hear my banjo ringin while the night dew falls and the horn owl calls by the old barn gate i singin Oh, Miss Lindy, don't you hear me, child? Melindy, Melindy, my love for you does drive me wild. Melindy, oh, Melindy, 
I'll sing this night till broad daylight. Bust my throat with trying. Lest you come down, Miss Lindy Brown, and stops this heart from sighing. The Conjure Man. Oh, chill and run, the Conjure Man. Him mouth as big as a frying pan. Him ears him small, him eyes him red. Him have no tooth in him all head. Him have him roots, him work him trick. Him roll him eye, him make you sick. The Conjure Man, the Conjure Man. Oh, chill and run, the Conjure Man. Him have a ball of red, red hair. Him hide it on the kitchen stair. Ma'am Jude, her paws along that way. And now her have a snake, they say. Him wrap around her body tight. Her eyes pop out, a awful sight. The Conjure Man, the Conjure Man. Oh, chill and run, the Conjure Man. Miss Jane, her driving from a dough. And now her hens won't lay no more. The Jussie cow, her dumb fall sick. Hit all them by the conjure trick. Him put a root in Lodge's bed. And now the man, he show sure am dead. The conjure man, the conjure man. Oh, chill and run, the conjure man. Me see him stand the other night. Right in the road, in white moonlight. Him toss him arms, him whirl him round. Him stomp him foot upon the ground. The snakes come crawling one by one. Me hear him hiss. Me break and run. The conjure man. The conjure man. Oh, chill and run. The conjure man. Uncle F's banjo song. Clean the barn and sweep the flow. Sing my banjo sing. We gonna dance this evening show. Ring my banjo ring. Then hits up the road and down the lane. Hurry, nigga, you miss the train. The yellow girl, she dance so neat. The yellow girl, she looks so sweet. Ring my banjo ring. The moon come up, the sun go down. Sing my banjo sing. The nigga Zam all come from town. Ring my banjo ring. Then hits round the hill and through the field. Look out there, nigga, don't you still. The millions on them vines and green. The moon and bright, oh, you'll be seen. Ring my banjo ring. Old Dark Hair A old hair lived in a house on the hill. He hundred years old and never was ill. He ears they so long and eyes so big and his legs so spry that he dance a jig. He lived so long that he know everything's about the beasts that walks and the birds that sings. This old dark hair will live up there in a mighty fine house on a mighty high hill. He doctor for all the beasts and birds. He put on his specs and he use big words. He feel they pulse and then look mighty wise. He pull out his watch and he shut both eyes. He grab up his hat and grab up his cane. Then blam go the dough. And he gone like the train. This old dark hair will live up there in a mighty fine house on a mighty high hill. Mr. Bear falls sick. They sent for dark hair. Oh, doctor, come quick and see Mr. Bear. He mighty not dead, just shows you bone. Too much a young pig, too much a green corn. As he put on his hat, said old dark hair. I take long my lance and lance Mr. Bear, said old dark hair would live up there in a mighty fine house on a mighty high hill. Mr. Bear, he groaned. Mr. Bear, he growled. While the old Miss Bear and the children howled, Dr. Hare took out a sharp little lance. He pierced Mr. Bear till he made him prance. Then grab up his hat and grab up his cane. Blam, go the dough. And he gone like the train. This old Doc Hare would live up there in a mighty fine house on a mighty high hill. But the very next day, Mr. Bear, he dead. When they tell Doc Hare, he just scratch his head. If persons get well or persons get worse, money got to come in the old hair purse. Not what folks does, but for what they know, does the folks get paid? And hair laughed low. This old Doc Hare would live up there in the mighty fine house on the mighty high hill. 
When Old Sis Judy Pray When Old Sis Judy Pray, the tears come stealing down my cheek. The voice of God would in me speak. I see myself so poor and weak. Down on my knees, the cross I seek. When Old Sis Judy Pray When Old Sis Judy Pray, the thunders of Mount Sinai Come rushing down from up on high. The devil turn his back and fly, while sinners loud for pardon cry. When old sis Judy pray, when old sis Judy pray, hard sinners tremble in their seat to hear her voice in sorrow peep, while all the church does sob and weep. Oh, shepherd, these thy poor lost sheep. When old sis Judy pray, when old sis Judy pray, the whole house hit they's rock and moan. To see her tears and hear her groan. There's something in Sis Judy's tone that melt all hearts, though made a stone. When old Sis Judy pray. When old Sis Judy pray, salvation's light comes pouring down. Hit fill the church and all the town. Why angels' robes go rustling round, and heaven on the earth am found. When old sis Judy pray, when old sis Judy pray, my soul goes sweeping up on wings, and loud the church with glory rings, and wide at the gates a jasper swings, till you hear hops with golden strings. When old sis Judy pray. Compensation. Oh, rich young lord. Thou ridest by with looks of high disdain. It chafes me not thy title high, thy blood of oldest strain. The lady riding at thy side is but in name thy promised bride. Ride on, young lord, ride on. Her father wills, and she obeys the custom of her class. Tis land, not love, the trothing sways, for land he sells his lass, her fair white hand, young lord, is thine. Her soul, proud fool, her soul is mine. Ride on, young lord, ride on. No title high my father bore, the tenant of thy farm. He left me what I value more, clean heart, clear brain, and strong arm. And love for bird and beast and bee, and song of lark and hymn of sea. Ride on, young lord, Right on. The boundless sky to me belongs, the paltry acres thine, the painted beauty sings thy songs, the lap rock lilts me mine. The hot house orchid blooms for thee, the gorse and heather bloom for me. Ride on, young lord, ride on. End of section four. Recording by Khalil B. Section 5 of the Book of American Negro Poetry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Book of American Negro Poetry, edited by James Weldon Johnson. Section 5. James D. Corothers. At the Closed Gate of Justice. To be a Negro in a day like this demands forgiveness, bruised with blow on blow, betrayed like him whose woe-dimmed eyes gave bliss, still must one succor those who brought one low, to be a negro in a day like this. To be a negro in a day like this demands rare patience, patience that can wait, in utter darkness, tis the path to miss, and knock unheeded at an iron gate. To be a negro in a day like this. To be a negro in a day like this demands strange loyalty. We serve a flag which is to us white freedom's emphasis. Ah, one must love and truth and justice lag to be a negro in a day like this. To be a negro in a day like this. Alas, Lord God, what evil have we done? Still shines the gate, all gold and amethyst. But I pass by the glorious goal unwon, merely a negro in a day like this.
Paul Lawrence Dunbar He came, a youth, singing in the dawn of a new freedom, glowing o'er his lyre, refining as with great Apollo's fire his people's gift of song, and thereupon this negro singer come to Helicon, constrain the masters, listening to admire, and rouse the race to wonder and aspire, gazing which way their honest voice was gone, with ebon face uplit of glory's crest, men marvelled at the singer strong and sweet, who brought the cabin's mirth, the tuneful night, but faced the morning, beautiful with light, to die while shadows yet fell towards the west and leave his laurels at his people's feet. Dunbar, no poet wears your laurels now, none rises singing from your race like you. Dark melodist, immortal, though the dew, fell early on the bays upon your brow, and tinged with pathos every halcyon vow, and brave endeavour, silence o'er you threw, flowers of love, or if an envious few, of your own people brought no garlands how could malice smite him whom the gods had crowned if like the meadow-lark your flight was low your flooded lyrics half the hilltops drowned a wide world heard you and it loved you so it stilled its heart to list the strains you sang and o'er your happy songs its plaudits rang the negro singer or all my song the image of a face lieth like shadow on the wild sweet flowers the dream the ecstasy that prompts my powers the golden lyre's delight brings little grace to bless the singer of a lowly race long hath this mocked me i in marvellous hours when hera's gardens gleamed or cynthia's bowers or hope's red pylons in their far hushed place but i shall dig me deeper to the gold Fetch water dripping over desert miles, From clear nianzas and mysterious niles of love, And sing, nor one kind act withhold, So shall men know me and remember long, Nor my dark face dishonour any song. The Road to the Bow Ever and ever anon, After the black storm, the eternal, beauteous bow, Brother to rose-painty mists that arch beyond, Blithely I go. My brows men laurelled, and my lyre twined with immortal ivy for one little rippling song. My house of golden leaves they praised, and passionate fire. But, friend, the way is long. Onward and onward, up, away. Though fear flaunt all his banners in my face, and my feet stumble, lo, the Orphean day. Forward, by God's grace. These signs are still before me, fear, danger, unprecedented, and I hear black no, still thundering, and churl, good friend, I rest me here, then to the glittering bow. Loometh and cometh hate in wrath, mailed wrong, swart servitude, and shame with bitter rue, nathless a negro poet's feet must tread the path the winged god knew. Thus, my true brother, dreamlet, I forfend the anathema following the span. I hold my head as proudly high as any man. In the matter of two men, one does such work as one will not, and well each knows the right. Though the white storm howls or the sun is hot, the black must serve the white. And it's, oh, for the white man's softening flesh while the black man's muscles grow, while I know which grows the mightier, I know, full well I know. The white man seeks the soft fat place, and he moves and works by rule, ingenious grows the humbler race in oppression's prodding school, and it's, oh, for a white man gone to seed, while the negro struggles so, and I know which race develops most, I know, yes, well I know. The white man rides in a palace car, and the negro rides Jim Crow. To damn the other with bolt and bar, one creepeth so low, so low. And it's, oh, for a master's nose in the mire, while the humbled hearts o'erflow. Well, I know whose soul grows big at this, and whose grows small, I know. The white man leases out his land, and the negro tills the same. 
One works, one loafs and takes command, but I know who wins the game. And it's, oh, for the white man's shrinking soil, as the black rich acres grow. Well, I know how the signs point out at last. I know, ah, well I know. The white man votes for his color's sake, while the black for his is barred. Though ignorance is the charge they make, but the black man studies hard. And it's, oh, for the white man's sad neglect, for the power of his light let go. So I know which man must win at last. I know, a ah, friend, I know. An Indignation Dinner There was hard times just for Christmas round our neighborhood one year, so we held a secret meeting, where the white folks couldn't hear, discuss the situation and to see what could be done to add a first-class Christmas dinner and a little Christmas fun. Rufus Green, who called the meeting, rose and said, In this your town, and throughout the land, the white folks is a-trying to keep us down. See, they's bought us, sold us, beat us, now they booze us cause we's free, but when they touch my stomach, they's done gone too fur for me. Is I right? You show us, Rufus, roared a dozen hungry throats. If you'd keep a mule a walkin, don't you tamper with his oats. That's sense, continued Rufus, but these white folks nowadays, as Don got so close and stingy, you can't live on what they pays. Here tis Christmas time, and folks is eyes indignant enough to choke. Was a Christmas dinner comin when we's most completely broke? I can't hardly fold a toothpick and a glass of water, mad? Say, I'm desperate, they just better treat me nice, these white folks had. Well, they abused the white folks scandalous till old Pappy Simmons riz, leanin on his cane to spotin on account his rheumatiz, and see chillin. What's that wintry wind a sighing do the street? But you wasted summer wages, but no matter, we must eat. Now I see a beautiful turkey on a certain gemmin's farm. He's a growin fat and sassy and a struttin to a charm. Chickens, sheep, hogs, sweet potatoes, all the craps is fine this year. All we needs is a committee for the to the goodies here. Well, we lit right in and voted that it was a grand ID. And the dinner we had Christmas was worth travelling miles to see. And we eat a full and plenty, big and little, great and small. Not because we was dishonest, but indignant, sir, that's all. Dream and the Song So oft our hearts, beloved lute, in blossomy haunts of song are mute. So long we pour, mid murmurings dull, or loveliness unutterable. So vain is all our passion strong, the dream is lovelier than the song. The rose thought, touched by words, doth turn, wan ashes, still from memory's urn, the lingering blossoms tenderly refute our wilding minstrelsy. Alas, we work, but beauty's wrong, the dream is lovelier than the song. Yearn Shelley, or the golden flame, left Keats for beauty's lure and name, but writ in water, woe is me, to grieve our flowerful fairy. My Phasian doves are flown so long, the dream is lovelier than the song. Ah, though we build a bower of dawn, the golden-winged bird is gone, and morn may gild through shimmering leaves, only the swallow twittering eaves. What art may house or gold prolong, a dream far lovelier than a song? The lilting witchery, the unrest of winged dreams is in our breast, but ever dear fulfilment's eyes gaze otherward, the long-sought prize, my lute, must to the gods belong. The dream is lovelier than the song. End of section 5《セクション6 of the Book of American Negro Poetry》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Gore《The Book of American Negro Poetry》Edited by James Weldon Johnson《セクション6》Daniel Webster Davis Way down south. Oh, the birds are sweetly singing way down south, and the banjo is a ringing way down south. 
and my heart it is a sighing while the moments am a flying from my home i'm a crying way down south dar the pickaninnies is playing way down south and for them i'm a praying way down south and when i get some money you can bet i'm going my honey for the land that am so sunny way down south while the wind up here's a blowing way down south the corn is sweetly growing way down south they tells me here of freedom but i ain't a gwine to heed em but i's gwine for to leave em for way down south i been up here workin from way down south and i ain't a been a shirkin i'm from way down south but i'm gettin mighty weary and the days are gettin dreary and i'm hungry oh so berry for my home down south Oh, the moon there shines the brighter way down south, and I know my heart is lighter way down south, and the very thought brings pleasure. I'll be happy there without measure, for there I have my treasure way down south. Hog Meat these eatin' folk may tell me of the glories of spring lamb and the toothsomeness of turkey et with celery and with jam, a beefsteak fried with onions and seasoned up so fine. But you just can give me hog meat, and I'm happy all the time. When the frost is on the pumpkin and the snowflakes in the air, I then begin rejoicing. Hog killin' time is near. And the visions of the future then fill my nightly dreams, for the time is fast a coming for delicious pork and beans. We folks that's from the country may be behind the sun. We don't like city eatings with beefsteaks that ain't done. Though mutton chops is splendid and them veal cutlets fine, to me tain't like a spare rib or great big chunk of chine. Just talk to me about hog meat, if you want to see me pleased, for biled with beans tis gorgeous, or made in hoghead cheese. And I could just be happy, doubt money, clothes, or house, with plenty of yours and pig feet made in old-fashioned souse. I fess I'm only human. I have my joys and cares. Some days the clouds hang heavy, some days the skies are fair, but I forgive my enemies. My heart is free from hate when my bread is filled with cracklings and there's chidlings on my plate. Though possum meat is glorious with taters in the pan, but put alongside pork sausage, it takes a backward stand. Of all your fancy eatings, just give to me for mine some souse or pork or chitlins, some spire rib or the chine. End of section six. Recording by David Gore. Section seven of the Book of American Negro Poetry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Khalil B. The Book of American Negro Poetry, Section 7, William H. A. Moore Dusk Song The garden is very quiet tonight. The dusk has gone with the evening star, and out on the bay, a lone ship light makes a silver pathway over the bar, where the sea sings low. I follow the light with an earnest eye, creeping along to the thick, far away, until it fell in the depths of the deep, dark sky with the haunting dream of the dusk of day and its lovely glow. Long nights, long nights and the whisperings of new ones, flame the line of the pathway down to the sea 
with the halo of new dreams and the hallow of old ones, and they bring magic light to my love reverie and a lover's regret. Tender sorrow for loss of a soft murmured word, tender measure of doubt in a faint aching heart, tender listening for wind songs in the tree heights heard, when you and I were of the dusks apart, are with me yet. I pray for faith to the noble spirit of space, I sound the cosmic depths for the measure of glory which will bring to this earth the imperishable race of whom beauty dreamed in the soul-toned story the prophets told. Silence and love and deep wonder of stars doth silver the heavens from west to east, from south to north, and in a maze of bars invisible I wander far from the feast as night grows old. Half blind is my vision, I know to the truth, my ears are half deaf to the voice of the tear that touches the silences as autumn's ruth steals through the dusks of each returning year a goodly friend. The autumn, then winter and wintertime's grief, but the weight of the snow is the glistening gift which loving brings to the rose and its leaf, for the days of the roses glow in the drift and never end. The moon has come, Wan and pallid is she, the spell of half-memories, the touch of half-tears, and the wounds of worn passion she brings to me, with all the tremor of the far-off years, and their mad wrong. Yet the garden is very quiet tonight, the dusk has long gone with the evening star, and out on the bay the moon's wan light lays a silver pathway beyond the bar, dear heart, pale and long. It was not fate. It was not fate which overtook me. Rather, a wayward, willful wind that blew hot for a while, and then, as the even shadows came, blew cold. What pity is it that a man grown old in life's dreaming should stop, even for a moment, to look into a woman's eyes? And I forgot, forgot that one's heart must be steeled against the east wind. Life and death alike come out of the east, life as tender as young grass, death as dreadful as the sight of clotted blood. I shall go back into the darkness, not to dream, but to seek the light again. I shall go by paths, mayhap, on roads that wind around the foothills, where the plains are bare and wild, and the passers-by come few and far between. I want the night to be long, the moon blind, the hills thick with moving memories, and my heart beating, a breathless requiem for all the dead days I have lived. When the dawn comes, dawn, deathless, dreaming, I shall will that my soul must be cleansed of hate. I shall pray for strength to hold children close to my heart. I shall desire to build houses where the poor will know shelter, comfort, beauty. And then may I look into a woman's eyes and find holiness, love, and the peace which passeth understanding. End of section 7 Read by Khalil B. Section 8 of the Book of American Negro Poetry This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Fanu Jahangiri The Book of American Negro Poetry Edited by James Weldon Johnson Section 8 W. E. Burkhardt Dubois A Litany of Atlanta Done at Atlanta in the Day of Death, 1906 O silent God, thou whose voice afar in mist and mystery has left our ears a hungered in these fearful days, Hear us, good Lord. Listen to us, thy children. Our faces dark with doubt are made a mockery in thy sanctuary. 
with uplifted hands we front thy heaven o god crying we beseech thee to hear us good lord we are not better than our fellows lord we are but weak and human men when our devils do deviltry curse thou the doer and the deed curse them as we curse them do to them all and more than ever they have done to innocence and weakness to womanhood and home have mercy upon us miserable sinners and yet whose is the deeper guilt who made these devils who nursed them in crime and fed them on injustice who ravished and debauched their mothers and their grandmothers who bought and sold their crime and waxed fat and rich on public iniquity thou knowest good god is this thy justice o father that guile be easier than innocence and the innocents crucified for the guilt of the untouched guilty is this thy justice o father that guile be easier than innocence and the innocent crucified for the guilt of the untouched guilty justice o judge of man wherefore do we pray is not the god of the fathers dead have not seers seen in heaven's halls thine hears and lifeless form stark amidst the black and rolling smoke of sin where all along bow bitter forms of endless dead awake thou that sleepest thou art not dead but flown afar up hills of endless light through blazing corridors of suns where worlds do swing of good and gentle men of women strong and free far from the cozenage black hypocrisy and chaste prostitution of this shameful speck of dust turn again o lord leave us not to perish in our sin from lust of body and lust of blood great god deliver us from lust of power and lust of gold great god deliver us a city lay in travail god or lord and from her loans sprang twin murder and black hate red was the midnight clang crack and cry of death and fury filled the air and trembled underneath the stars when church spires pointed silently to thee and all this was to save the greed of greedy men who hide behind the veil of vengeance bend us thine ear o lord in the pale still morning we looked upon the deed we stopped our ears and held our leaping hands but they did they not wag their heads and leer and cry with bloody jaws cease from crime the word was mockery for thus they train a hundred crimes while we do kill one turn again our captivity o lord behold this maimed and broken thing dear god it was an humble black man who told and sweat to save a bit from the pittance paid him they told him work and rise he worked did this man sin nay but someone told how someone said another did one whom he had never seen nor known yet for that man's crime this man lieth maimed and murdered his wife naked to shame his children to poverty and evil hear us o heavenly father does not this justice of hell stink in thy nostrils o god how long shall the mounting flood of innocent blood roar in thine ears and pound in our hearts for vengeance pile the pale frenzy of blood crazed brutes who do such deeds high on thine altar jehovah jira and burn it in hell forever and forever forgive us good lord we know not what we say bewildered we are and passion toast mad with the madness of a mob and mocked and murdered people straining at the armpost of thy throne we raise our shackled hands and, and charge thee god by the bones of our stolen fathers by the tears of our dead mothers by the very blood of thy crucified christ what meaneth this tell us the plan give us the sign keep not thou silence o oh god sit no longer blind lord god deaf to our prayer and dumb to our dumb suffering surely thou too art not white o lord the pale bloodless heartless thing our christ of all the pities forgive the thought 
forgive these wild blasphemous words thou art still the god of our black fathers and in thy soul soul sits some soft darkening of the evening some shadowings of the velvet night but whisper speak call great god for thy silence is white terror to our hearts the way o god show us the way and point us the path whither north in north is greed and south is blood within the coward and without the liar whither to death amen welcome dark sleep whither to life but not this life dear god not this let the cup pass from us tempt us not beyond our strength for there is that clamoring and clawing within to whose voice we would not listen yet shudder lest we must and it is red ah god it is a red and awful shape salah in yonder is trembles a star vengeance is mine i will repay saith the lord thy will o lord be done kyrie eleison lord we have done these pleading wavering words we beseech thee to hear us good lord we bow our heads and hearken soft to the sobbing of women and little children we beseech thee to hear us good lord our voices sink in silence and in night hear us good lord in night o god of a godless land amen in silence o silent god salah end of section eight recording by farno jahangiri Section 9 of the Book of American Negro Poetry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Book of American Negro Poetry. Edited by James Weldon Johnson section nine george marion mcclellan dogwood blossoms to dreamy langors and the violet mist of early spring the deep sequestered vale gives first her paling blue miamiest where blithely pours the cuckoo's annual tale of summer promises and tender green of a new life and beauty yet unseen the forest trees have yet a sighing mouth where dying winds of march their branches swing while upward from the dreamy sunny south a hand invisible leads on the spring his rounds from bloom to bloom the bee begins with flying song and cowslip wine he sups where to the warm and passing southern winds azaleas gently swing their yellow cups soon everywhere with glory through and through the fields will spread with every brilliant hue but high o'er all the early floral train where softest all the arching sky resumes the dogwood dancing to the wind's refrain in stainless glory spreads its snowy blooms a butterfly in church why dost thou hear thou shining sinless thing with many colored hues and shapely wing why quit the open field and summer air to flutter here thou hast no need of prayer tist meet that we who this great structure built should come to be redeemed and washed from guilt for we this gilded edifice within are come with erring hearts and stains of sin but thou art free from guilt as god on high go seek the blooming waste and open sky and leave us here our secret woes to bear confessionals and agonies of prayer 
the hills of Suwanee. Suwanee hills of dear delight, prompting my dreams that used to be. I know you are waiting me still tonight by the Unica range of Tennessee. The blinking stars in endless space, the broad moonlight and silvery gleams, tonight caress your windswept face and fold you in a thousand dreams. Your far outlines, less seen than felt, which win with hill propensities. In moonlight dreams I see you melt away in vague immensities and far away i still can feel your mystery that ever speaks of vanished things as shadows steal across your breast and rugged peaks oh dear blue hills that lie apart and wait so patiently down there your peace takes hold upon my heart and makes its burden less to bear the feet of judas christ washed the feet of judas the dark and evil passions of his soul his secret plot and sordidness complete his hate his purposing christ knew the whole and still in love he stooped and washed his feet christ washed the feet of judas yet all his lurking sin was bare to him his bargain with the priest and more than this in oliviate beneath the moonlight dim a forehand knew and felt his treacherous kiss christ washed the feet of judas and so ineffable his love twas meet that pity fill his great forgiving heart and tenderly to wash the traitor's feet who in his lord had basely sold his part christ washed the feet of judas and thus a girded servant self-abased taught that no wrong this side the gate of heaven was ever too great to wholly be effaced and though unmasked in spirit be forgiven and so if we have ever felt the wrong of trampled rights of caste it matters not whate'er the soul has felt or suffered long o oh heart this one thing should not be forgot christ washed the feet of judas end of section nine recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Section 10 of the Book of American Negro Poetry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Fado Jahangiri. The Book of American Negro Poetry, edited by James Weldon Johnson. Section 10. William Stanley Braithwaite. Sandy Star and Willie G. Sandy Star and Willie G. Count them two, you make them three. Pluck the man and boy apart, and you'll see into my heart. Sandy Star. One. Sculptured Worship. The zones of warmth around his heart no alien airs had crossed, but he awoke one morn to feel the magic numbness of autumnal frost. His thoughts were a loose skein of threads, and tangled emotions, vague and dim, and sacrificing what he loved, he lost the dearest part of him. In sculptured worship now he lives, his one desire a prison ache. If he can never melt again, his very heart will break. 2. Laughing it out he had a whim and laughed it out upon the exit of a chance he floundered in the sea of doubt if life was real or just romance sometimes upon his brow would come 
a little pucker of defiance. He told told in a word the sum of all men made of facts and science, and then a hearty laugh would break, a reassuring shrug of shoulder, and we would from his fancy take a faith in death would make life bolder. 3. Exit No, his exit by the gate will not leave the wind ajar. He will go when it is late with a misty star. One will call he cannot see, one will call he will not hear. He will take no company, nor a hope or fear. We shall smile who loved him so, they who gave him hate will weep. But for us the winds will blow, pulsing through his sleep. 4. The Way he could not tell the way he came because his chart was lost yet all his way was paved with flame from the bourne he crossed he did not know the way to go because he had no map he followed where the winds blow and the april sap he never knew upon his brow the secret that he bore and laughs away the mystery now the darks at his door Five. Honest Probandi No more from out the sunset, no more across the foam, no more across the windy hills will send his star come home. He went away to search it with a curse upon his tongue, and in his hand the staff of life made music as it swung. I wonder if he found it and knows the mystery now, or sandy star who went away with a secret on his brow. Del Saskar Del Saskar, Del Saskar, stood upon a flaming star, stood and let his feet hang down, till in China the toes turned brown, and he reached his fingers over the rim of the sea, like sails from Dover, and caught a mandarin at prayer, and tickled his nose in Orion's hair. The sun went down through crimson bars, and left his blind face battered with stars, but the brown toes in China kept, Hot the tears till Casker wept. Turn me to my yellow leaves. Turn me to my yellow leaves. I am better satisfied. There is something in me grieves that was never born and died. Let me be a scarlet flame on a windy autumn morn. I who never had a name nor from breathing image born. From the margin let me fall where the farther stars sink down and the void consumes me all in nothingness to drown. Let me dream my dream entire, withered as an autumn leaf. Let me have my vain desire, vain as it is brief. Ironic LLD There are no hollows any more between the mountains. The prairie floor is like a curtain with the drape of the wind's invisible shape and nowhere seen and nowhere heard the seas quiet as a sleeping bird now we're traveling what holds back arrival in the very track where the urge put forth so we stay and move a thousand miles a day times a fancy ringing bells whose meaning charlatan history tells scintilla i kissed the kiss in youth upon a dead man's brow and that was long ago and i'm a grown man now it's lame there in the dust, thirty years and more, my lips that set alight at the dead man's door. Sequita. Heart free, hand free, blue above, brown under, all the world to me is a place of wonder. Sunshine, moonshine, stars and winds are blowing, all into this heart of mine, flowing, flowing, flowing. Mind free, step free, days to follow after, Joys of life, sold to me for the price of laughter. Girl's love, man's love, love of work and duty, just the will of God to prove beauty, beauty, beauty. Rhapsody I am glad they long for the gift of song, for time and change and sorrow, for the sunset wings and the world and things which hang on the edge of tomorrow. I am glad for my heart whose gates apart are the entrance place of wonders where dreams come in from the rush and din like sheep from the rains and thunders 
End of section 10. Recording by Farnad Jahangiri. Section 11 of the Book of American Negro Poetry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Fanny Jahangiri. The Book of American Negro Poetry. Edited by James Weldon Johnson. Section 11. George Reginald Margetson stands us from the fledgling bar and the poetry society. Part one. I'm out to find the new, the modern school where science trains the fledgling bar to fly, where critics teach the ignorant, the fool to write the stuff the editors would buy. It matters not even though it be a lie. Just so it aims to smash tradition's crown and build up one instead decked with a new renown. A thought is haunting me by night and day, and in some safe archive I seek to lay it. I have some startling thing I wish to say, and they can put me wise just how to say it. Without their aid I, like the ass, must pray it, without due knowledge of its mood and tense, and so it is sure to fail the bar to recompense. Will some kind one direct me to that college where every budding genius now is headed, the only source to gain poetic knowledge where all the sacred truths lay deep embedded, where nothing but the genuine goods are shredded, the factory where they shape new feet and meters that make poetic symbols sound like carpet beaters? I hope... I'll be an eligible student, even though I am no poet in a sense, but just a hot-head youth with ways imprudent, a rustic ranting rhymer like by chance, who thinks that he can make the muses dance by beating on some poet's borrowed lyre to win some fool's applause and please his own desire. Perhaps they'll never know or even suspect that I am not a true Aegean poet, if in the poet's colors I am decked, they may not ask me, ere to prove or show it. I'll play the wise old cock, nor try to crow it, but be content to gaze with open mind. I never show the lead, but I things from behind. Part 2 I have a problem all alone to solve, a problem how to find a poetry club. It makes my sky piece like a top revolve, for fear that they might mark me for a snob. They'll call me poetry monger and then dub me rustic rhymer anything they choose. I anything at all but heaven's immortal muse. Great Byron, when he published his childly book, in which he sang of all his lovely dears, called forth hot condemnation and cold look from lesser mortals who were not his peers. They chided him for telling his affairs because they could not tell their own so well. They played the poet lord and made his life as hell. They called him lewd, wild, drunkard, vicious, white, and all because he dared to tell the truth. Because he was no cursed hermaphrodite, a full-fledged genius with a fire of youth, they hounded him, they hammered him forsooth, because he blended human with divine. They branded him the bard of women and of wine. Of course I soak the booze once in a while, but I don't wake the town to sing and shout it. I love the girls, they win me with a smile, but no one knows, for I won't write about it. And so the fools may never think to doubt it, when I declare I am a mortal man, as gifted, yes, as good as God did ever plan. Every man has got a hobby. Every poet has some fault. Every sweet contains its bitter, every fresh thing has its salt. Every mountain has a valley, every valley has a hill. Every ravine is a river, every river is a rill. Every fool has got some wisdom, every wise man is a fool. Every scholar is a blockhead, every dunce has been to school. Every bad man is a good man, every fat man is not stout. Every good man 
is a bad man, but it's hard to find him out. Every strong man is a weak man. You may doubt it as you please. Every well man is a sick man. Every doctor has disease. End of section 11. Recording by Farno Jahangiri. Section 12 of the Book of American Negro Poetry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of American Negro Poetry, edited by James Weldon Johnson. Section 12. James Weldon Johnson. O black and unknown bards o black and unknown bards of long ago how came your lips to touch the sacred fire how in your darkness did you come to know the power and beauty of the minstrel's lyre who first from midst his bonds lifted his eyes who first from out the still watch lone and long feeling the ancient faith of prophets rise within his dark-kept soul burst into song heart of what slave poured out such melody as steal away to jesus on its strains his spirit must have nightly floated free though still about his hands he felt his chains who heard great jordan roll whose starward i saw chariot swing low and who was he that breathed that comforting melodic sigh nobody knows the trouble i see what merely living clod what captive thing could up toward god through all its darkness grope and find within its deadened heart to sing these songs of sorrow love and faith and hope how did it catch that subtle undertone that note in music heard not with the ears how sound the elusive reed so seldom blown which stirs the soul or melts the heart to tears not that great german master in his dream of harmonies that thundered amongst the stars at the creation ever heard a theme nobler than go down moses mark its bars how like a mighty trumpet call they stir the blood such are the notes that men have sung going to valorous deeds such tones there were that helped make history when time was young there is a wide wide wonder in it all that from degraded rest and servile toil the fiery spirit of the seer should call these simple children of the sun and soil o oh, black slave singers gone forgot unfamed you you alone of all the long long line of those who've sung untaught unknown unnamed have stretched out upward seeking the divine you sang not deeds of heroes or of kings no chant of bloody war no exulting paean of arms won triumphs but your humble strings you touched in chord with music empyrean you sang far better than you knew the songs that for your listeners hungry hearts sufficed still live but more than this to you belongs you sang a race from wood and stone to christ since you went away seems lack to me de stars don't shine so bright seems lack to me de sun done lost his light seems like to me dere's nothing goin right since you went away seems like to me de sky ain't half so blue seems like to me dat everything wants you seems like to me i don't know what to do since you went away seems like to me dat everything is wrong seems like to me de days just twice as long seems like to me de birds forgot his song since you went away seems like to me i just can't help but sigh seems like to me my throat keeps gettin dry seems like to me a tear stays in my eye since you went away the creation a negro sermon 
and god stepped out on space and he looked around and said i'm lonely i'll make me a world and far as the eye of god could see darkness covered everything blacker than a hundred midnights down in a cypress swamp then god smiled and the light broke and the darkness rolled up on one side and the light stood shining on the other and god said that's good then god reached out and took the light in his hands and god rolled the light around in his hands until he made the sun and he set that sun ablazing in the heavens and the light that was left from making the sun god gathered it up in a shining ball and flung it against the darkness spangling the night with the moon and stars then down between the darkness and the light he hurled the world and god said that's good then god himself stepped down and the sun was on his right hand and the moon was on his left the stars were clustered about his head and the earth was under his feet and god walked and where he trod his footsteps hollowed the valleys out and bulged the mountains up then he stopped and looked and saw that the earth was hot and barren so god stepped over to the edge of the world and he spat out the seven seas he batted his eyes and the lightnings flashed he clapped his hands and the thunders rolled and the waters above the earth came down the cooling waters came down then the green grass sprouted and the little red flowers blossomed the pine tree pointed his finger to the sky and the oak spread out his arms the lakes cuddled down in the hollows of the ground and the rivers ran down to the sea and god smiled again and the rainbow appeared and curled itself around his shoulder then god raised his arm and he waved his hand over the sea and over the land and he said bring forth bring forth and quicker than god could drop his hand fishes and fowls and beasts and birds swam the rivers and the seas roamed the forests and the woods and split the air with their wings and god said that's good then god walked around and god looked around on all that he had made he looked at his sun and he looked at his moon and he looked at his little stars he looked on his world with all its living things and god said i'm lonely still then god sat down on the side of a hill where he could think by a deep wide river he sat down with his head in his hands god thought and thought till he thought i'll make me a man up from the bed of the river god scooped the clay and by the bank of the river he kneeled him down and there the great god almighty who lit the sun and fixed it in the sky who flung the stars to the most far corner of the night who rounded the earth in the middle of his hand this great god like a mammy bending over her baby kneeled down in the dust toiling over a lump of clay till he shaped it in his own image then into it he blew the breath of life and man became a living soul amen amen the white witch oh brothers mine take care take care the great white witch rides out to-night trust not your prowess nor your strength your only safety lies in flight for in her glance there is a snare and in her smile there is a blight the great white witch you have not seen then younger brothers mine forsooth like nursery children you have looked for ancient hag and snaggletooth but no not so the witch appears in all the glowing charms of youth her lips are like carnations red her face like new-born lilies fair her eyes like ocean waters blue she moves with subtle grace and air and all about her head there floats the golden glory of her hair but though she always thus appears in form of youth and mood of mirth unnumbered centuries are hers the infant planets saw her birth the child of throbbing life is she twin sister to the greedy earth and back behind those smiling lips and down within those laughing eyes and underneath the soft caress of hand and voice and purring sighs the shadow of the panther lurks the spirit of the vampire lies for i have seen the great white witch and she has led me to her lair and i have kissed her red red lips and cruel face so white and fair 
around me she has twined her arms and bound me with her yellow hair i felt those red lips burn and sear my body like a living coal obeyed the power of those eyes as the needle trembles to the pole and did not care although i felt the strength go ebbing from my soul oh she has seen your strong young limbs and heard your laughter loud and gay and in your voices she has caught the echo of a far-off day when man was closer to the earth and she has marked you for her prey she feels the old antean strength in you the great dynamic beat of primal passions and she sees in you the last besieged retreat of love relentless lusty fierce love pain ecstatic cruel sweet oh brothers mine take care take care the great white witch rides out to-night oh younger brothers mine beware look not upon her beauty bright for in her glance there is a snare and in her smile there is a blight mother night eternities before the first-born day or ere the first sun fledged his wings of flame calm night the everlasting and the same a brooding mother over chaos lay and whirling suns shall blaze and then decay shall run their fiery courses and then claim the haven of the darkness whence they came back to nirvanic peace shall grope their way so when my feeble sun of life burns out and sounded is the hour for my long sleep i shall full weary of the feverish light welcome the darkness without fear or doubt and heavy-lidded i shall softly creep into the quiet bosom of the night o oh, southland o oh, southland o oh, southland have you not heard the call the trumpet blown the word made known to the nations one and all the watchword the hope word salvation's present plan a gospel new for all for you man shall be saved by man o oh, southland o oh, southland do you not hear to-day the mighty beat of onward feet and know you not their way tis forward tis upward on to the fair white arch of freedom's dome and there is room for each man who would march o oh, southland fair southland then why do you still cling to an idle age and a musty page to a dead and useless thing tis springtime tis work time the world is young again and god's above and god is love and men are only men o oh, southland my southland o oh, birthland do not shirk the toilsome task nor respite ask but gird you for the work remember remember that weakness stalks in pride that he is strong who helps along the faint one at his side brothers see there he stands not brave but with an air of sullen stupor mark him well is he not more like brute than man look in his eye no light is there none save the glint that shines in the now glaring and now shifting orbs of some wild animal caught in the hunter's trap how came this beast in human shape and form speak man we call you man because you wear his shape how are you thus are you not from that docile childlike tender-hearted race which we have known three centuries not from that more than faithful race which through three wars fed our dear wives and nursed our helpless babes without a single breach of trust speak out i am and am not then who why are you i am a thing not new i am as old as human nature i am that which lurks ready to spring whenever a bar is loosed the ancient trait which fights incessantly against restraint balks at the upward climb the weight forever seeking to obey the law of downward pull and i am more the bitter fruit am i of planted seed the resultant the inevitable end of evil forces and the powers of wrong lessons in degradation taught and learned the memories of cruel sights and deeds the pent-up bitterness the unspent hate filtered through fifteen generations have sprung up 
and found in me sporadic life in me the muttered curse of dying men on me the stain of conquered women and consuming me the fearful fires of lust lit long ago by other hands than mine in me the down-crushed spirit the hurled back prayers of wretches now long dead their dire bequests in me the echo of the stifled cry of children for their bartered mother's breasts i claim no race no race claims me i am no more than human dregs degenerate the monstrous offspring of the monster sin i am just what i am the race that fed your wives and nursed your babes would do the same to-day but i enough the brute must die quick chain him to that oak it will resist the fire much longer than this slender pine now bring the fuel pile it round him wait pile not so fast or high or we shall lose the agony and terror in his face and now the torch good fuel that the flames already leap head high ha hear that shriek and there's another wilder than the first fetch water water pour a little on the fire lest it should burn too fast hold so now let it slowly blaze again see there he squirms he groans his eyes bulge wildly out searching around in vain appeal for help another shriek the last watch how the flesh grows crisp and hangs till turned to ash it sifts down through the coils of chain that hold erect the ghastly frame against the bark scorched tree stop to each man no more than one man's share you take that bone and you this tooth the chain let us divide its links this skull of course in fair division to the leader comes and now his fiendish crime has been avenged let us back to our wives and children say what did he mean by those last muttered words brothers in spirit brothers indeed are we fifty years eighteen sixty three to nineteen thirteen on the fiftieth anniversary of the signing of the emancipation proclamation o oh, brothers mine to-day we stand where half a century sweeps our ken since god through lincoln's ready hand struck off our bonds and made us men just fifty years a winter's day as runs the history of a race yet as we look back o'er the way how distant seems our starting-place look farther back three centuries to where a naked shivering score snatched from their haunts across the seas stood wild-eyed on virginia's shore this land is ours by right of birth this land is ours by right of toil we help to turn its virgin earth our sweat is in its fruitful soil where once the tangled forest stood where flourished once rank weed and thorn behold the path traced peaceful wood the cotton white the yellow corn to gain these fruits that have been earned to hold these fields that have been won our arms have strained our backs have burned bent bare beneath a ruthless sun that banner which is now the type of victory on field and flood remember its first crimson stripe was dyed by attic's willing blood and never yet has come the cry when that fair flag has been assailed for men to do for men to die that we have faltered or have failed we've helped to bear it rent and torn through many a hot breathed battle breeze held in our hands it hath been borne and planted far across the seas and never yet o oh, haughty land let us at least for this be praised has one black treason guided hand ever against that flag been raised then should we speak but servile words or shall we hang our heads in shame stand back of new-come foreign hordes and fear our heritage to claim no stand erect and without fear and for our foes let this suffice we've bought a rightful sonship here 
and we have more than paid the price and yet my brothers well i know the tethered feet the pinioned wings the spirit bowed beneath the blow the heart grown faint from wounds and stings the staggering force of brutish might that strikes and leaves us stunned and dazed the long vain waiting through the night to hear some voice for justice raised full well i know the hour when hope sinks dead and round us everywhere hangs stifling darkness and we grope with hands uplifted in despair courage look out beyond and see the far horizon's beckoning span faith in your god-known destiny we are a part of some great plan because the tongues of garrison and phillips now are cold in death think you their work can be undone or quench the fires lit by their breath think you that john brown's spirit stops that lovejoy was but idly slain or do you think those precious drops from lincoln's heart were shed in vain that for which millions prayed and sighed that for which tens of thousands fought for which so many freely died god cannot let it come to naught end of section twelve section thirteen of the book of american negro poetry this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by david gore the book of american negro poetry edited by james weldon johnson section thirteen john wesley holloway miss mellerly hello there miss mellerly oh you are a pretty sight to see soft brown cheek and smiling face and willowy form chuck full of grace the sweetest gal i ever see and i wish that you would marry me hello miss merrily hello there miss mellerly you're the bear gal for me curly teeth shining hair and silky arms so plump and bare i like your walk i like your clothes and the way i love you goodness knows hello miss merrily hello there miss merrily that's not your name but it ought to be i never seed your face before and likely won't again no more but your sweet smile will follow me clear into eternity farewell miss merrily calling the doctor i'm sick doctor man i'm sick give me something to help me quick don't i'll die tried mighty hard for to cure myself tried all them things on the pantry shelf couldn't find nothing at all would do and so i sent for you what i take well let me see first whorehound drops and catnip tea then rock candy soaked in rum, and a good-sized chunk of camphor gum. Next I tried was castor oil, and snake root tea brought to a boil, sassafras tea for to clean my blood, but none of them things didn't do no good. Then when home remedies seemed to shirt, them pantry bottles was put to work. Blue mass, laudanum, liver pills, 66 forever and chills ready relief and a b c and half a bottle of x y z and several more i don't recall they never done no good at all my appetite begun to fail and forced some clabber about a pail for my old grandma always said when you can't eat you're almost dead so i got scared and sent for you now doctor see what you can do I'm sick, doctor man. God knows I'm sick. Give me something to help me quick. Don't I'll die. The Corn Song Just beyond a clump of pines, listen to him now. 
he had a jolly black boy singing at his plow. In the early morning, through the hazy air, loud and clear, sweet and strong comes the music rare. Oh, my dovey, whoa, do you love me? Whoa, whoa. And as he turns the cotton row, hear him tell his old mule so, whoa, ha, come here. Don't you love a corn song? How it stirs your blood. Everybody listening in the neighborhood, standing in your front door in the misty morn, hear the jolly black boy singing in the corn. Oh, Miss Julie, whoa, love me truly, whoa, whoa. Here I'm scold his mule so when he try to make him go, gee, whoa. Come here. Oh, you jolly black boy, yodeling in the corn, calling to your darling in the dewy morn. Love her, boy, forever. Yodel every day. Only let me listen as you sing away. Oh, my darling, whoa. Hear me calling, whoa, whoa. Turn around another row, holler to your mule so, whoa. Ha! Come here. Black Mammies If I ever get to glory, and I hope to make it through, I expect to hear a story, and I hope you'll hear it too. It'll cover Maine to Texas, and from Boston to Miami, of the highest shaft and glory erected to Negro Mammy. You will see a lot of Washington, and Washington again, and good old Father Lincoln towering above the rest of men. But there'll be a bunch of women standing hard up by the throne, and they'll all be black and homely, lest the Virgin Mary's one. They will be the talk of angels. They will be the praise of men. And the white folks will go crazy without their mammy folks again. If it's really true that meekness makes you heir to all the earth, then our blessed good old mammies must have been a noble birth. If the greatest is the servant, then I got to say it in. They'll be standing next to Jesus, sub to no one else but him. If the crown goes to the faithful and the palm the victors wear, they'll be loaded down with jewels more than anybody there. She the hardest road to travel ever mortal had to pull, but she knelt down in her cabin till her cup of joy was full. The old Satan tried to shake her from her knees with scowl and frown. She just clumb up Jacob's ladder, and he never drug her down. She just croon above the babies. She just sing when things went wrong. And no matter what the trouble, she would meet it with a song. She just prayed her way to heaven, finding comfort in the rod. She just stole her way to Jesus. She just sung her way to God. She kept a looking over Jordan, kept a trusting in the word, kept a looking for the chariot, kept a waiting for the Lord. If she ever had the quaver of the shadow of a doubt, it ain't never been discovered for she never sung it out. But she trusted in the shadow, and she trusted in the shine, and she longed for one possession, that heaven to be mine. And she prayed her chilling freedom, but she won herself the best, peace on earth amidst her sorrows, and up yonder heavenly red. End of section 13. Recording by David Gore.
Section 14 of the Book of American Negro Poetry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Gore. The Book of American Negro Poetry, edited by James Weldon Johnson. Section 14. Leslie Pinckney Hill. Tuskegee. Wherefore this busy labor without rest? Is it an idle dream to which we cling here where a thousand dusky toilers sing unto the world their hope? Build we our best by hand and thought, they cry, although unblessed. So the great engines throb and anvils ring, and so the thought is wedded to the thing. But what shall be the end, and what the test? Dear God, we dare not answer. We can see not many steps ahead, but this we know. If all our toilsome building is in vain, availing not to set our manhood free, if envious hate roots out the seed we sow, the South will wear eternally a stain. Christmas at Melrose Come home with me a little space, and browse about our ancient place. Lay by your wanted troubles here, and have a turn of Christmas cheer. These sober walls of weathered stone can tell a romance of their own, and these wide rooms of devious line are kindly meant in their design. Sometimes the north wind searches through, but he shall not be rude to you. We'll light a log of generous girth for winter comfort, and the mirth of healthy children you shall see about a sparkling Christmas tree. Eleanor, leader of the fold, Hermione with heart of gold, Elaine with comprehending eyes, and two more yet of coddling size, Natalie pondering all that's said and Mary with the cherub head. All these shall give you sweet content and care-destroying merriment, while one with true Madonna grace moves round the glowing fireplace where Father loves to muse aside and Grandma sits in silent pride. And you may chafe the wasting oak or freely pass the kindly joke to mix with nuts and homemade cake and apples set on coals to bake, or some fine carol we will sing in honor of the Manger King, or hear great Milton's organ verse or Plato's dialogue rehearse what Socrates with his last breath sublimely said of life and death. These dear delights we fain would share with friend and kinsman everywhere, and from our door see them depart each with a little lighter heart. Summer Magic So many cares to vex the day, so many fears to haunt the night. My heart was all but weaned away from every lure of old delight. Then summer came, announced by June, with beauty, miracle, and mirth. She hung aloft the rounding moon, she poured her sunshine on the earth. She drove the sap and broke the bud, she set the crimson rose afire. She stirred again my sullen blood and waked in me a new desire. Before my cottage door she spread the softest carpet nature weaves, and deftly arched above my head a canopy of shady leaves. Her nights were dreams of jeweled skies, her days were bowers rife with song, and many a scheme did she devise to heal the hurt and soothe the wrong. For on the hill or in the dell, or where the brook went leaping by, or where the fields would surge and swell with golden wheat or bearded rye, 
I felt her heart against my own. I breathed the sweetness of her breath till all the cark of time had flown, and I was lord of life and death. THE TEACHER Lord, who am I to teach the way to little children day by day, so prone myself to go astray? I teach them knowledge, but I know how faint they flicker and how low the candles of my knowledge glow. I teach them power to will and do, but only now to learn anew my own great weakness through and through. I teach them love for all mankind and all God's creatures, but I find my love comes lagging far behind. Lord, if their guide I still must be, oh, let the children see the teacher leaning hard on thee. End of section 14. Recording by David Gore. Section 15 of the Book of American Negro Poetry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Book of American Negro Poetry. Edited by James Walden Johnson. Section 15. Edward Smith Jones. A Song of Thanks. For the sun that shone at the dawn of spring, for the flowers which bloom and the birds that sing, for the verdant robe of the gray old earth, for her coffers filled with their countless worth, for the flocks which feed on a thousand hills, for the rippling streams which turn the mills, for the lowing herds in the lovely vale, for the songs of gladness on the gale. From the gulf and the lakes to the ocean's banks, Lord God of hosts, we give thee thanks. For the farmer reaping his whitened fields, for the bounty which the rich soil yields, for the cooling dews and refreshing rains, for the sun which ripens, the golden grains for the bearded wheat and the fattened swine for the stalled ox and the fruitful vine for the tubers large and cotton white for the kid and the lambkin frisk and blithe for the swan which floats near the river banks lord god of hosts we give thanks for the pumpkin sweet and the yellow yam for the corn and beans and the sugared ham, for the plum and the peach and the apple red, for the dear old press where the wine is tread, for the cock which crows at the breaking dawn, and the proud old turk of the farmer's barn, for the fish which swim in the babbling brooks, for the game which hide in the shady nooks, from the gulf and the lakes to the ocean's banks lord god of hosts we give thanks for the sturdy oaks and the stately pines for the lead and the coal from the deep dark mines for the silver ores of a thousand fold for the diamond bright and the yellow gold for the river boat and the flying train for the fleecy sail of the rolling mane for the velvet sponge and the glossy pearl for the flag of peace which we now unfurl from the gulf and the lakes to the ocean's banks lord god of hosts we give thanks for the lowly cot and the mansion fair for the peace and plenty together share for the hand which guides us from above for thy tender mercies abiding love for the blessed home with its children gay for returnings of thanksgiving day for the bearing toils and the sharing cares we lift up our hearts in our songs 
and our prayers from the gulf and the lakes to the ocean's banks lord god of hosts we give thanks End of section 15section 16 of the book of american negro poetry this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the book of american negro poetry edited by james weldon johnson section sixteen ray g dandridge time to die black brother think you life so sweet that you would live at any price does mere existence balance with the weight of your great sacrifice or can it be you fear the grave enough to live and die a slave o oh, brother be it better said when you are gone and tears are shed that your death was the stepping stone your children's children crossed upon men have died that men might live look every foeman in the eye if necessary your life give for something ere in vain you die ill toozle head to r v p come listen while your uncle sings er bout how low sweet chariot swings trunt angel with fout wings my little toozle head stop stop how dare you laugh at me because i foul de time and key thinks you dat i is black patty my tizzle toozle head o oh, honey lamb dim sparklin eyes dat often laughs and seldom cries is show a good gib natural prize my little toozle head and dose we bands so soft and sweet mates with dem toddlin velvet feet just to round ye out complete my little toozle head smart you smart as smartin can be knows your eva a b c plumb on down to x y z my ill toozle head de man don't know how much he miss if he ain't got no nice like dis for your uncle one more kiss my little toozle head i wish some magic we'd allow by charm or craft don't matter how you stay just like you is right now my little toozle head salka petruza who was christened lucy jane she danced near nude to tom tom beat with swaying arms and flying feet mid swirling spangles gauze and lace her all was dancing save her face a conscious dumb to brooding fears companion hearing deaf to cheers a body marshalled by the will kept dancing while a heart stood still and eyes obsessed with vacant stare looked over heads to empty air as though they sought to find therein redemption for a maiden sin twas thus amid force driven grace we found the lost look on her face and then to us did it occur that though we saw we saw not her spring fever dars a lazy sorta of hazy feeling grips me though and though and i feels lack like doin less than anything do de saw is sharp and greasy do de tas in hen is easy and de day am fair and breezy dars a thief 
dat steals ambition in de wind can't defy it can't deny it case it just won't be denied it's a moss persistent stubborn sort of thin anti talks don't neutralize it doctors fail to analyze it so i yields do i despise it to dat restless wretched fever ear sprin de drum manja he's struttin sure enough wearing a lady's muff and weighs upon his head red coat all breadest red putty white satin vest gold braid across de chest goodness he cuts a stunt prancin out dar in front leading his band when da a whistle blows each man behind him knows zackly what he must do you bet he does it too when da brass stick he twirls ole maids a lub stick girls looks on with longin eyes to simply idolize dat handsome man sweet fife and piccolo buff warblin soft and low slight horn and saxophones jazz syncopated tones snare drum and lead cornet alto and clarinet last but not least dar come cymbals and big brass drum oh what a band cause we all understand each piece helps make the band but they all must be led someone must be the head no doubt the centipede has all the legs he need but take er away the head po centipede am dead so am the band end of section sixteen section number seventeen of the book of american negro poetry this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the book of american negro poetry edited by james weldon johnson section seventeen fenton johnson children of the sun we are children of the sun rising sun weaving southern destiny waiting for the mighty hour when our shiloh shall appear with the flaming sword of right with the steel of brotherhood and emboss in crimson dye liberty fraternity we are the stardust folk striving folk sorrow songs have lulled to rest seething passions wrought through wrongs let us where the moon rays dip in the night of dull despair showed us where the star gleams shine and the mystic symbols glow liberty fraternity we have come through cloud and mist mighty men dusk has kissed our sleep-born eyes reared for us a mystic throne in the splendor of the skies that shall always be for us children of the nazarene children who shall ever sing liberty fraternity the new day from a vision red with war i awoke and saw the prince of peace hovering over no man's land loud the whistles blew and the thunder of cannon was drowned by the happy shouting of the people from the sinai that faces armageddon i heard this chant from the throats of white-robed angels blow your trumpets little children from the east and from the west from the cities in the valley from god's dwelling on the mountain 
Blow your blast that peace might know. She is queen of God's great army. With the crying blood of millions, we have written deep her name in the book of all the ages. With the lilies in the valley, with the roses by the mercy, with the golden flower of Jersey, we have crowned her smooth young temples. Where her footsteps cease to falter, golden grain will greet the morning. Where her chariot descends, shall be broken down the altars of the gods of dark disturbance. Nevermore shall men know suffering, nevermore shall women wailing shake to grief the god of heaven from the east and from the west from the cities in the valley from god's dwelling on the mountain little children blow your trumpets from ethiopia growing neath her heavy burdens i heard the music of the old slave songs i heard the wail of warriors dusk brown who grimly fought the fight of others in the trenches of mars i heard the plea of blood-stained men of dusk and the crimson in my veins leapt furiously forget not o oh my brothers how we fought in no man's land that peace might come again forget not o oh my brothers how we gave red blood to save the freedom of the world we were not free our tawny hands were tied but belgium's plight and serbia's woes we shared each rise of sun or setting of the moon so when the bugle blast had called us forth we were not like the surly brute of yore but as the spartan proud to give the world the freedom that we never knew nor shared these chains, O oh brothers mine, have weighed us down, as Samson in the temple of the gods. Unloosen them, and let us breathe the air that makes the golden rod the flower of Christ. For we have been with thee in no man's land, through lake of fire and down to hell itself. And now we ask of thee our liberty, our freedom in the land of stars and stripes i am glad that the prince of peace is hovering over no man's land tired i am tired of work i am tired of building up somebody else's civilization let us take a rest melissy jane i will go down to the last chance saloon drink a gallon or two of gin shoot a game or two of dice and sleep the rest of the night on one of mike's barrels you will let the old shanty go to rot the white people's clothes turn to dust and the calvary baptist church sink to the bottomless pit you will spend your days forgetting you married me and your nights hunting the worn gin mike serves the ladies in the rear of the last chance saloon Throw the children into the river. Civilization has given us too many. It is better to die than it is to grow up and find out that you are colored. Pluck the stars out of the heavens. The stars mark our destiny. The stars marked my destiny. I am tired of civilization. The Banjo Player There is music in me. The music of a peasant people i wander through the levee picking my banjo and singing my songs of the cabin and the field at the last chance saloon i am as welcome as the violets in march there is always food and drink for me there and the dimes of those who love honest music behind the railroad tax the little children clap their hands and love me as they love Kris Kringle. But I fear that I am a failure. Last night a woman called me a troubadour. What is a troubadour? The Scarlet Woman Once I was good like the Virgin Mary and the minister's wife. 
My father worked for Mr. Pullman and white people's tips, but he died two days after his insurance expired. I had nothing, so I had to go to work. All the stock I had was a white girl's education and a face that enchanted the men of both races. Starvation danced with me. So when Big Lizzie, who kept a house for white men, came to me with tales of fortune that I could reap from the sale of my virtue, I bowed my head to vice. Now I can drink more gin than any man for miles around. Gin is better than all the water in Leth. End of section 17「Section 18 of the Book of American Negro Poetry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit us at LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The Book of American Negro Poetry is edited by James Weldon Johnson. Section 18 the Rubenstein Staccato Etude by R. Nathaniel Dett. Staccato, staccato, leger agitato. In and out does the melody twist. Unique proposition is this composition. Alas for the player who hasn't the wrist. Now in the dominant theme ringing prominent, bass still repeating its one monotone, double notes crying, up keyboard go flying, the change to the minor comes in like a groan. Without a cessation, a chaste modulation hastens adown to subdominant key, where melody mellow-like, singing so cello-like, rises and falls in a wild ecstasy. Scarce is this finished when chords all diminished, break loose in a patter that comes down like rain a pedal point wonder rivaling thunder now all is mad agitation again like laughter jolly begins the finale again does the cello its tones seem to lend diminuendo ad molto crescendo ah rubenstein only could make such an end end of section eighteen the rubenstein staccato etude Section 19 of the Book of American Negro Poetry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annalisa Bodker. The Book of American Negro Poetry. Edited by James Weldon Johnson. Section 19. Georgia Douglas Johnson. The Heart of a Woman. The heart of a woman goes forth with the dawn, as a lone bird, soft winging, so restlessly on. Afar o'er life's turrets and veils does it roam, in the wake of those echoes the heart calls home. The heart of a woman falls back with the night and enters some alien cage in its plight and tries to forget it has dreamed of the stars while it breaks, breaks, breaks on the sheltering bars. Youth The dew is on the grasses, dear, the blush is on the rose, and swift across our dial youth a shifting shadow goes. The primrose moments, lush with bliss, exhale and fade away. Life may renew the autumn time, but never more the May. Lost Illusions Oh, for the veils of my faraway youth, shielding my heart from the blaze of the truth. Why did I stray from their shelter and grow? into the sadness that follows, to know. Impotent Adam with desolate gaze, threading the tumult of hazardous ways, 
Oh, for the veils, for the veils of my youth, veils that hung low or the blaze of the truth. I want to die while you love me. I want to die while you love me, while yet you hold me fair, while laughter lies upon my lips and lights are in my hair. I want to die while you love me and bear to that still bed your kisses, turbulent, unspent, to warm me when I'm dead. I want to die while you love me. Oh, who would care to live till love has nothing more to ask and nothing more to give? I want to die while you love me and never, never see the glory of this perfect day grow dim or cease to be. Welt, would I might mend the fabric of my youth that daily flaunts its tatters to my eyes? Would I might compromise a while with truth until our moon now waxing wanes and dies? For I would go a further while with you and drain this cup so tantalant and fair which meets my parched lips like cooling dew ere time has brushed cold fingers through my hair. My Little Dreams I'm folding up my little dreams within my heart tonight and praying I may soon forget the torture of their sight. For time's deft fingers scroll my brow with fell relentless heart. I'm folding up my little dreams tonight within my heart. End of section 19. Recording by Annalisa Bodker. Section 20 of the Book of American Negro Poetry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Book of American Negro Poetry, edited by James Weldon Johnson, Section 20, Claude McKay. The Lynching His spirit in smoke ascended to high heaven. His father, by the crudest way of pain, had bidden him to his bosom once again. The awful sin remained still unforgiven. All night a bright and solitary star, for a chance the one that ever guided him, yet gave him up at last to fate's wild whim, hung pitifully o'er the swinging char. Day dawned, and soon the mixed crowds came to view the ghastly body swaying in the sun. The women thronged to look, but never a one showed sorrow in her eyes of steely blue. And little lads, lynchers that were to be, danced round the dreadful thing in fiendish glee. If we must die, if we must die, let it not be like hogs, hunted and pinned in an inglorious spot, while round us bark the mad and hungry dogs, making their mock at our accursed lot. If we must die, oh, let us nobly die, so that our precious blood may not be shed in vain. Then even the monsters we defy shall be constrained to honor us, though dead. O oh, kinsmen, we must meet the common foe, Though far outnumbered, let us still be brave, and for their thousand blows deal one death blow. What though before us lies the open grave? Like men we'll face the murderous, cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying, but fighting back. To the White Fiends Think you I am not fiend and savage too? Think you I could not arm me with a gun, and shoot down ten of you for every one of my black brothers murdered, burnt by you. Be not deceived, for every deed you do I could match, outmatch. Am I not Africa's son, black of that black land where black deeds are done? But the Almighty from the darkness drew my soul and said, Even thou shalt be a light while to burn on the benighted earth. Thy dusky face I set among the white for thee to prove thyself of highest worth. 
before the world is swallowed up in night to show thy little lamp go forth go forth the harlem dancer a plodding youth laughed with young prostitutes and watched her perfect half-clothed body sway her voice was like the sound of blended flutes blown by black players upon a picnic day she sang and danced on gracefully and calm the light gauze hanging loose about her form to me she seemed a proudly swaying palm grown lovelier for pressing through a storm upon her swarthy neck black shiny curls profusely fell and tossing coins in praise the wine-flushed bold-eyed boys and even the girls devoured her with their eager passionate gaze but looking at her falsely smiling face i knew herself was not in that strange place harlem shadows i hear the halting footsteps of a lass in negro harlem when the night lets fall its veil i see the shapes of girls who pass eager to heed desire's insistent call ah little dark girls who in slippered feet go prowling through the night from street to street through the long night until the silver break of day the little gray feet know no rest through the lone night until the last snowflake has dropped from heaven upon the earth's white breast the dusky half-clad girls of tired feet are trudging thinly shod from street to street ah stern harsh world that in the wretched way of poverty dishonor and disgrace has pushed the timid little feet of clay the sacred brown feet of my fallen race ah heart of me the weary weary feet in harlem wandering from street to street after the winter some day when trees have shed their leaves and against the morning's white the shivering birds beneath the eaves have sheltered for the night we'll turn our faces southward love toward the summer isle where bamboos spire and shafted grove and wide-mouthed orchids smile and we will seek the quiet hill where towers the cotton tree and leaps the laughing crystal rill and works the droning bee and we will build a lonely nest beside an open glade and there forever will we rest o love o nut-brown maid spring in new hampshire too green the springing april grass too blue the silver speckled sky for me to linger here alas while happy winds go laughing by wasting the golden hours indoors washing windows and scrubbing floors too wonderful the april night too faintly sweet the first may flowers the stars too gloriously bright for me to spend the evening hours when fields are fresh and streams are leaping wearied exhausted dully sleeping the tired worker oh whisper my soul the afternoon is waning into evening whisper soft peace o oh my rebel heart for soon the moon from out its misty veil will swing aloft be patient weary body soon the night will wrap thee gently in her sable sheet and with a leaden sigh thou wilt invite to rest thy tired hands and aching feet the wretched day was theirs the night is mine come tender sleep and fold me to thy breast but what steals out the gray clouds red like wine o oh, dawn o oh, dreaded dawn o oh, let me rest weary my veins my brain my life have pity no once again the hard ugly city the barrier i must not gaze at them although your eyes are dawning day i must not watch you as you go your sun illumined way i hear but i must not heed the fascinating note which fluting like a river reed comes from your trembling throat i must not see upon your face love's softly glowing spark for there's the barrier of race you are fair, and I am dark. To O E A, your voice is the color of a robin's breast, and there's a sweet sob in it like rain. Still rain in the night among the leaves of the trumpet tree, close to the nest. The pea dove sings, and each note thrills me with strange delight, 
like the words wet with music that well from your trembling throat i'm afraid of your eyes they're so bold searching me through reading my thoughts shining like gold but sometimes they are gentle and soft like the dew on the lips of the eucharist before the sun comes warm with his lover's kiss you are sea foam pure with the star's loveliness not mortal a flower a fairy too fair for the beauty shorn earth all wonderful things all beautiful things gave of their wealth to your birth oh i love you so much not reckoning of passion that i feel it is wrong but men will love you flower fairy non-mortal spirit burdened with flesh forever lifelong flame heart so much have i forgotten in ten years so much in ten brief years i have forgot what time the purple apples come to juice and what month brings the shy forget-me-not forgotten is the special startling season of some beloved trees flowering and fruiting what time of year the ground doves brown the fields and fill the noonday with their curious fluting i have forgotten much but still remember the poinsettias red blood red in warm december i still recall the honey fever grass but i cannot bring back to mind just when we rooted them out of the penguin path to stop the mad bees in the rabbit pen i often try to think in what sweet month the languid painted ladies used to dapple the yellow by road mazing from the main sweet with the golden threads of the rose apples i have forgotten strange but quite remember the poinsettias red blood red in warm december what weeks what months what time of the mild year we cheated school to have our fling at tops what days our wine-thrilled bodies pulsed with joy feasting upon blackberries in the copse oh some i know i have embalmed the days even the sacred moments when we played all innocent of passion uncorrupt at noon and evening in the flame's heart shade we were so happy happy i remember beneath the poinsettias red in warm december two and six merry voices chattering nimble feet and pattering big and little faces gay happy day dis market day saturday de morning break soon soon market people awake and de light sunshine from de moon while dem boy wid pantaloon roll up over dem knee pan tap across de buckra lane to de pasture wid a horse feeding long wid de jackass and de mule can't in de track wid him trail up in him back and a catchin to defy no care had the boy might try in de early morning tide when de cocks grow on de hill and de stars are shining still merry by de fireside hots de coffee for de lad comin ridin on de pads drown cross de manimal donkey horse too and de mule which at last had come down to cool on the bit dem hall dem full racin over pasture land see dem comin every man comin for de steamin tea over hilly track and lee hard worked at dante hard worked donkey on the road trotted with dem usual load humper pack with yam and grain soursop and governor cane cause sun sits in higher dray drivin long de market way whole week grindin sugar cane through de boilin sun and rain now atter de toilin hard he goes seekin his reward while he's thinkin in him mine of dare dear ones left behind o de love do ailin wife darlin treasure of his life and the picnies six in all whose nuff burdens pawn him fall seven lubbin ones in need seven hungry mouths for feed on dear wants he thinks alone never dreamin of his own but gwine on wit his joyful face till him wretch de market-place sugar bears no price to-day though it is de month de may when de time is hellish hot and de water coconut and de cane be bridge is nice mix up wit lily rice big and little great and small a full yam is all de call sugar tup and gill a quart yet de people hab de heart want em barter top a hit want de sweatin hagler fed ram de pan and pile it up 
yet so life is so so tough cousin son is looking sad as de market is so bad pon him and him rest him chin quietly sit down thinking of de loved wife sick in bed and de children to be fed what de labors would say when dem no him couldn't pay also what about de mill where him hire from old bill so him think and think on so till him thoughts no more could go then he got up and began picking him up sugar pan in his ears rang through the din only two and six a ten what a tale he'd got to sell how bad bad de sugar sell taking out de lee amount him sat down and began count all the time him mind a doubt how expenses would pay out ah it nod him like de ticks sugar sell the two and six so he journeys on the way feeling sad this market day knowing buy a little cake to give baby when she wake passing long to candy shop doubtin eben make a stop to buy drops for lazy son for de lily cash nay a done so him wretch him own a ground and de children scamper round each one stretching out him hand lookin to de poor sad man oh how much he felt the blow as he watched dem face fall low and dem wait and nothing came and drew back their hands with shame but the sick wife kissed his brow son don't get downhearted now if we only pay expense we must work we common sense cut and carve and carve and cut make gil sob for quite a what we must try make two ends meet never mind how hard be it we won't mind a haul and pole well then pick me barely full and a shadow left him face and him felt an inward peace as he blessed his better part for her sweet and gentle heart dear one of my heart my breed won't i love you to the deet when my heart is weak and sad who but you can make it glad so they kissed and kissed again and their thoughts were not on pain but was way down in the south where they'd wedded in their youth in the morning of their life free from all the grief and strife happy in the morning light never thinking of the night so they clated everything and the profit it could bring after all the business fix was a princely two and six end of section twenty section twenty one of the book of american negro poetry this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Book of American Negro Poetry, edited by James Weldon Johnson. Section 21. Joseph S. Cotter, Jr. A Prayer As I lie in bed, flat on my back, there passes across my ceiling an endless panorama of things quick steps of gay-voiced children adolescence in its wandering silences maid and man on moonlit summer's eve women in the holy glow of motherhood old men gazing silently through the twilight into the beyond o oh god give me words to make my dream children live and what shall you say brother come and let us go unto our god and when we stand before him i shall say lord i do not hate i am hated i scourge no one i am scourged i covet no lands my lands are coveted i mock no peoples my people are mocked and brother what shall you say is it because i am black why do men smile when I speak, and call my speech the whimperings of a babe, that cries but knows not what it wants? Is it because I am black? Why do men sneer when I arise and stand in their councils, and look them eye to eye, and speak their tongue? Is it because I am black? The Band of Gideon the band of Gideon roam the sky, the howling wind is their war cry, the thunder's roll is their trump's peal, 
and the lightning flash their vengeful steel each black cloud is a fiery steed and they cry aloud with each strong deed the sword of the lord and gideon and men below rear temples high and mock their god with reasons why and live in arrogance sin and shame and rape their souls for the world's good name each black cloud is a fiery steed and they cry aloud with each strong deed the sword of the lord in gideon the band of gideon roam the sky and view the earth with baleful eye in holy wrath they scourge the land with earthquake storm and burning brand each black cloud is a fiery steed and they cry aloud with each strong deed the sword of the lord and gideon the lightnings flash and the thunders roll and lord have mercy on my soul cry men as they fall on the stricken sod in agony searching for their god each black cloud is a fiery steed and they cry aloud with each strong deed the sword of the lord in gideon and men repent and then forget that heavenly wrath they ever met the band of gideon yet will come and strike their tongues of blasphemy dumb each black cloud is a fiery steed and they cry aloud with each strong deed the sword of the lord and gideon rain music on the dusty earth drum beats the falling rain now a whispered murmur now a louder strain slender silvery drumsticks on an ancient drum beat the mellow music bidding life to come chords of earth awakened notes of greening spring rise and fall triumphant over everything slender silvery drumsticks beat the long tattoo god the great musician calling life anew supplication i am so tired and weary so tired of the endless fight so weary of waiting the dawn and finding endless night that i ask but rest and quiet rest for days that are gone and quiet for the little space that i must journey on end of section twenty one Section 22 of the Book of American Negro Poetry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Gore. The Book of American Negro Poetry, edited by James Weldon Johnson. Section 22 Roscoe C. Jameson. THE NEGRO SOLDIERS These truly are the brave, these men who cast aside old memories to walk the blood-stained pave of sacrifice, joining the solemn tide that moves away to suffer and to die for freedom when their own is yet denied. O pride, O prejudice, when they pass by, hail them, the brave, for you now crucified. These truly are the free, these souls that grandly rise above base dreams of vengeance for their wrongs, who march to war with visions in their eyes of peace through brotherhood, lifting glad songs aforetime while they front the firing line. Stand and behold, they take the field to-day, shedding their blood like him now held divine, that those who mock might find a better way. End of section 22. Recording by David Gore. Section number 23 of the Book of American Negro Poetry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Book of American Negro Poetry. Edited by James Weldon Johnson. Section 23. Jesse Faust. La vie, c'est la vie. On summer afternoons I sit, 
quiescent by you in the park and idly watch the sunbeams gild and tint the ash tree's bark or else i watch the squirrels frisk and chafer in the grassy lane and all the while i mark your voice breaking with love and pain i know a woman who would give her chance of heaven to take my place to see the love light in your eyes the love glow on your face and there's a man whose lightest word can set my chilly blood afire fulfillment of his least behest defines my life's desire but he will none of me nor i of you nor you of her tis said the world is full of jests like these i wish that i were dead christmas eve in france o oh, little christ why do you sigh as you look down to-night on breathless france on bleeding france and all her dreadful plight what bows your childish head so low what turns your cheek so white o oh, little christ why do you moan what is it that you see in mourning france in martyred france and her great agony does she recall your own dark day your own gethsemane o oh, little christ why do you weep why flow your tears so sore for pleading france for praying france a suppliant at god's door god sweeten not my cup you say shall he for france do more o oh, little christ what can this mean why must this horror be for fainting france for faithful france and her sweet chivalry i bled to free all men you say france bleeds to keep men free o oh, little lovely christ you smile what guardian is in store for gallant france for glorious france and all her valiant corp behold i live and france like me shall live for evermore dead fires if this is peace this dead and laden thing then better far the hateful fret the sting better the wound for ever seeking balm than this gray calm is this pain's surcease better far the ache the long drawn dreary day the night's white wake better the choking sigh the sobbing breath than passion's death or eflam i can remember when i was a little young girl how my old mommy would sit out of doors in the evenings and look up at the stars and groan and i would say mommy what makes you groan so and she would say i am groaning to think of my poor children they do not know where i be and i don't know where they be i look up at the stars and they look up at the stars sojourner truth i think i see her sitting bowed and black stricken and seared with slavery's mortal scars reft of her children lonely anguished yet still looking at the stars symbolic mother we thy myriad sons pounding our stubborn hearts on freedom's bars clutching our birthright fight with faces set still visioning the stars oblivion from the french of massillon coicou haiti i hope when i am dead that i shall lie in some deserted grave i cannot tell you why but i should like to sleep in some neglected spot unknown to every one by every one forgot there lying i should taste with my dead breath the utter lack of life the fullest sense of death and i should never hear the note of jealousy or hate the tribute paid by passers-by to tombs of state 
to me would never penetrate the prayers and tears that futility bring torture to dead and dying ears there i should lie annihilate and my dead heart would bless oblivion the shroud and envelope of happiness end of section 23 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section number 24 of the book of american negro poetry this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the book of american negro poetry edited by james weldon johnson section twenty four anne spencer before the feast of shushan garden of shushan after eden all terrace pool and flower recollect thee ye wavers in saffron and haze and tyrian purple tell yet what range in color wakes the eye sorcerer release the dreams born here when drowsy shifting palm shade espels the brain and sound ye with harp and flute nur essay before these star noted birds escaped from paradise a while too stir all dark and dear and passionate desire till mine arms go out to be mocked by the softly kissing body of the wind slave send vashti to her king the fiery wattles of the sun startle into flame the marble towers of shushan so at each day's wane two peers the one in heaven the other on earth welcome with their splendor the peerless beauty of the queen cushioned at the queen's feet and upon her knee finding glory for mine head still nearly shamed am i the king to bend and kiss with sharp breath the olive pink of sandaled toes between or lift me high to the magnet of a gaze dusky like the pool when but the moon ray strikes to its depth or closer pressed to crush a grape gainst lips redder than the grape a rose in the night of her hair then sharon's rose in my arms and i am hard to force the petals wide and you are fast to suffer and be sad is any prophet come to teach a new thing now in a more apt time have him maze how you say love is sacrament how say vashti love is both bread and wine how to the altar may not come to break and drink hulky flesh nor fleshly spirit i thy lord like not manna for meat as adjudan i thy master drink and red wine plenty and when i thirst eat meat and full when i hunger i thy king teach you and leave you when i list no woman in all persia sets out strange action to confuse persia's lord love is but desire and thy purpose fulfillment i thy king so say at the carnival gay little girl of the diving tank i desire a name for you nice as a right glove fits for you who admit the malodorous mechanics of this unlovely thing our darling of spirit and form i know you a glance and what you are sits by the fire in my heart my limousine lady knows you or why does the slant envy 
of her eye mark your straight air and radiant inclusive smile guilt pins a fig leaf innocence is its own adorning the bull-necked man knows you this first time his itching flesh sees form divine and vibrant health and thinks not of his advocation i came in curiously set on no diversion save that my mind might safely nurse its brood of misdeeds in the presence of a blind crowd the color of life was gray everywhere the setting seemed right for my mood here the sausage and garlic booth sent unholy incense skyward there a quivering female thing gestured assassinations and lied gestured assassinations and lied to call it dancing there too were games of chance with chances for none but oh girl of the tank at last gleaming girl how intimately pure and free the gaze you send the crowd as though you know the dearth of beauty in its sordid life we need you my limousine lady the bull-necked man and i seeing you here brave and water clean leaven for the heavy ones of earth i am swift to feel that what makes the plotter glad is good and whatever is good is god the wonder is that you are here i have seen the queer in queer places but never before a heaven fed naiad of the carnival tank little diver destiny for you like as for me is shod in silence years may seep into your soul the back illy of the usual and the expedient i implore neptune to claim his child to-day the wife woman maker of sevens in the scheme of things from earth to star thy cycle holds whatever is fate and over the border the bar though rank and fierce the mariner sailing the seven seas he prays as he holds his glass to his eyes coaxing the pleiades i cannot love them and i feel your glad chiding from the grave that my all was only worth at all what joy to you it gave these seven links the law compelled for the human chain i cannot love them and you oh sevenfold months in flanders slain a jungle there a cave here bred six and a million years sure and strong mate for mate such love as culture fears i gave you clear the oil and wine you saved me your hob and hearth see how even life may be ere thee sickle comes and leaves a swath but i can wait the seven of moons or years i spare hoarding the heart's plenty nor spend a drop nor share so long but outlives a smile and a silken gown then gaily i reach up from my shroud and you glory clad reach down translation we trekked into a far country my friend and i our deeper content was never spoken but each knew all the other said he told me how calm his soul was laid by the lack of anvil and strife the wooing kestrel i said mutes his mating note to please the harmony of this sweet silence and when at the day's end we laid tired bodies gainst the loose warm sands and the air fleeced its particles for a coverlet when star after star came out 
to guard their lovers in oblivion my soul so leapt that my evening prayer stole my morning song dunbar ah how poets sing and die make one song and heaven takes it have one heart and beauty breaks it chatterton shelley keats and i ah how poets sing and die end of section 24 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc Section 25 of the Book of American Negro Poetry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Gore. The Book of American Negro Poetry, edited by James Weldon Johnson. Section 25, Alex Rogers why adam sinned i hear the old folks talking in our house the other night about adam in the scripture long ago the lady folk all abused him said he knowed it wasn't right and course the men folk they all said that's so i felt sorry for mr adam and i felt like putting in cause i knows more than they do all about what made adam sin adam never had no mammy for to take him on her knee and teach him right from wrong and show him things he ought to see i knows down in my heart he'd a let that apple be but adam never had no dear old mammy he never knew no childhood round the old log cabin door he never know no pickin' any life. He started in a great big grown-up man, and what is more, he never had the right kind of wife. Just s'pose he had a mammy when that temptin' did begin, and she'd a come and told him, Son, don't eat that. That's a sin. But Adam never had no mammy for to take him on her knee and teach him right from wrong and show him things he ought to see. I knows down in my heart he'd let that apple be. But Adam never had no dear old mammy. The Rain Song Brother Simmons Walk right in, Brother Wilson. How you feeling today? Brother Wilson. Just moderate, Brother Simmons, but then I generally feels that way. Brother Simmons. Here's white and black and brown and green. How's all you gentlemen's been? Brother White. My health is good, but my bin is slack. Brother Black. I's been suffering lot with pains in my back. Brother Brown. My old woman's sick, but I's all right. Brother Green. Yes, I went after doctor for her t'other night. Brother Simmons. Here's Sandy Turner as I live. Brother Turner. Yes, I didn't expect to get here, but here I is brother simmons now gentlemen's make yourselves to home there's nothing to fear my old woman's gone my stars the weather's powerful warm i wouldn't be surprised if we had a storm brother brown no brother simmons we can safely say tain't gwine to be no storm today Cause hear him facts that's mighty plain, and any time you sees him, you can look for rain. Any time you hears the chairs and the tables crack, and the folks with rheumatics, the giants is on the rack. All, look out for rain, 
rain, rain. When the ducks quack loud and the peacocks cry, and the far-off hills seem to be right nigh, prepare for rain, rain, rain. When the old cat on the hearth with a velvet paws gins to wipin over her whiskered jaws, show sign of rain, rain, rain. When the frog's done changed his yellow vest, and in his brown suit he's dressed, mo rain, and still more rain. When you notice the air, it stands stock still, and the blackbird's voice, it gets so awful shrill, dad am time for rain. When your dog quits bones and begins to fast, and when you see him eating, he's eating grass, shows true certainly sign of rain. Refrain. No, Brother Simmons, we can safely say, tain't gwine to be no rain today, cause the suit ain't fallen and the dogs ain't sleep. And you ain't seen no spiders from de cobwebs creep. Last night the sun went bright to bed, And the moon ain't never once been seen to hang a head. If you's watched all this, then you can safely say That there ain't a gwana be no rain today. End of section 25. Recording by David Gore. Section 26 of the Book of American Negro Poetry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Book of American Negro Poetry, edited by James Weldon Johnson. Section 26. Waverly Turner Carmichael. Keep me, Jesus, keep me. Keep me neath thy mighty wing. Keep me, Jesus, keep me. Help me praise thy holy name. Keep me, Jesus, keep me. O my lamb, come, my lamb. O my good lamb. Save me, Jesus, save me. Hear me as I cry to thee. Keep me, Jesus, keep me. May I that bright glory see. Keep me, Jesus, keep me. O my lamb, my good lamb. O my good lamb. Keep me, Jesus, keep me. Winter is coming. The winter days are drawn nigh, And by the fire I set and sigh. The northern wind is blown cold, Like it done in days of old. The yaller leaves are fallen fast, First summer days is been and past. The air is blowing mighty cold, Like it done in days of old. The frost has fallen on the grass, and seemed to say, This is your lass. The air is blowing mighty cold, like it done in days of old. End of section 26. Section 27 of the Book of American Negro Poetry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Book of American Negro Poetry, edited by James Weldon Johnson. Section 27. Alice Dunbar Nelson. Sonnet. I had no thought of violets of late, the wild, shy kind that spring beneath your feet in wistful April days, when lovers mate and wander through the fields in rapture sweet. The thought of violets meant florist shops and bows and pens and perfume papers fine, and garish lights and mincing little fops and cabarets and songs and deadening wine. So far from sweet real things my thoughts have strayed. I had forgot wide fields and clear brown streams, the perfect loveliness that God has made, wild violets shy and heaven-mounting dreams, and now unwittingly you've made me dream of violets, and my soul's forgotten gleam. End of section 27.
section number 28 of the book of american negro poetry this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the book of american negro poetry edited by james weldon johnson section twenty eight charles bertram johnson a little cabin des a little cabin big enough for two des a waden honey cozy fixed for you down da by de road not very far from town waden for de missus when she's ready to come down des a little cabin and er acre o ground vines a growing on it fruit trees all around hollyhocks a bloomin in de garden plot honey would you like to own dat little spot make dat little cabin cheery clean and bright with an angel in it like a ray of light make that little palace something fine and grand make it like an eden fur a lonely man des you listen honey while i splain it all how some ladies gonter boss that little hall des you take my ban dat's de way it's writ des you take my heart that's the deed to it negro poets full many lift and sing their sweet imaging not yet the lyric seer the one bard of the throng with highest gift a song breaks on our sentient ear not yet the gifted child with notes enraptured wild that storm and throng the heart to make his rage our own our hearts his lyric throne hard won by cosmic art i hear the sad refrain of slavery's sorrow strain the broken half lips speech of freedom's twilight hour the greater growing reach of larger latent power here and there a growing note swells from a conscious throat thrilled with a message fraught the pregnant hour is near we wait our lyric seer by whom our wills are caught who makes our cause and wrong the motive of his song who sings our racial good bestows us honor's place the cosmic brotherhood of genius not of race blind homer greek or jew of fame's immortal few would still be deathless born frail dumbar black or white in fame's eternal light would shine a star of morn an unhorizoned range our hour of doubt and change gives song a nightless day whose pen with pregnant mirth will give our longings birth and point our souls the way end of section twenty eight recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section number twenty nine of the book of american negro poetry this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Book of American Negro Poetry, edited by James Weldon Johnson. Section 29. Otto Leland Bohannon. The Dawn's Awake the dawn's awake a flash of smouldering flame and fire ignites the east 
Then higher, higher, o'er all the sky, so gray forlorn, the torch of gold is borne. The dawn's awake, the dawn of a thousand dreams and thrills, and music singing in the hills, a paean of eternal spring, voices the new awakening. The dawn's awake, whispers of pent-up harmonies, with the mingled fragrance of the trees, faint snatches of half-forgotten song. Fathers, torn and numb, the boon of light we craved, awaited long, has come, has come. The Washerwoman A great swark cheek and the gleam of tears, the flutter of hopes and the shadow of fears, and all day long the rub and scrub with only a breath betwixt tub and tub fool thou hast toiled for fifty years and what hast thou now but thy dusty tears in silence she rubbed but her face i had seen where the light of her soul fell shining and clean End of section 29. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 30 of the Book of American Negro Poetry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Bree Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Book of American Negro Poetry, edited by James Weldon Johnson, Section 30. Theodore Henry Shackelford, The Big Bell in Zion. Come, children, hear the joyful sound. Ding, dong, ding. Go spread the glad news all around. Ding, dong, ding. Oh, the big bell's tollin' up in Zion. The big bell's tollin' up in Zion. The big bell's tollin' up in Zion. Ding, dong, ding. I've been abused and tossed about. Ding, dong, ding. But glory to the Lamb, I shout. Ding, dong, ding. My brother just sent word to me. Ding, dong, ding that he done set his own self free ding dong ding old massa said he could not go ding dong ding but he done reached ohio show ding dong ding is gwine to be real nice and meek ding dong ding then i'll run away myself next week ding dong ding oh the big bell's tollin up in zion the big bell's tollin up in zion the big bell's tollin up in zion ding dong ding end of section 30 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc section 31 of the book of american negro poetry this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Book of American Negro Poetry, edited by James Weldon Johnson. Section 31. Lucian B. Watkins star of ethiopia out in the night thou art the sun toward which thy soul charmed children run the faith high height whereon they see the glory of their day to be the peace at last when all is done the night is dark but one by one thy signals ever and anon Smile beacon answers to their plea 
out in the night ah life thy storms these cannot shun give them a hope to rest upon a dream to dream eternally the strength of men who would be free and win the battle race begun out in the night two points of view from this low-lying valley oh how sweet and cool and calm and great is life i ween there on yon mountain throne that sun gold crest from this uplifted mighty mountain seat how bright and still and warm and soft and green seems yon low lily vale of peace and rest to our friends we've kept the faith our soul's high dreams untouched by bondage and its rod burn on and on and on it seems we shall have friends while god is god end of section 31 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section 32 of the book of american negro poetry this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the book of american negro poetry edited by james weldon johnson section thirty two benjamin brawley my hero to robert gold shaw flushed with the hope of high desire he buckled on his sword to dare the rampart ranged with fire or where the thunder roared into the smoke and flame he went for god's great cause to die a youth of heaven's element the flower of chivalry this was the gallant faith i trow of which the sages tell on such devotion long ago the benediction fell and never nobler martyr burned or braver hero died than he who worldly honor spurned to serve the crucified and lancelot and sir belvedere may pass beyond the pale and wander over moor and mere to find the holy grail but ever yet the prize forsooth my hero holds in fee and he is blameless knight in truth and galahad to me chaussier gone are the sensuous stars and manifold clear sunbeams burst upon the front of night ten thousand swords of azure and of gold give darkness to the dark and welcome light across the night of ages strike the gleams and leading on the gilded host appears an old man writing in a book of dreams and telling tales of lovers for the years still trulius hears a voice that whispers stay in nature's garden what a mad rout sings let's hear these motley pilgrims while away the tedious hours with stories of old things or might some shining eagle claim these lowly numbers for the house of fame end of section thirty two recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section thirty three of the book of american negro poetry this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the book of american negro poetry edited by james weldon johnson section thirty three 
Joshua Henry Jones, Jr. To a skull. Ghastly, ghoulish, grinning skull. Toothless, eyeless, hollow doll. Why your smirk and empty smile? As the hours away you while. Has the earth become such bore that it pleases nevermore? Whence your joy through sun and rain isn't because of loss and pain? Have you learned what men learn not? That earth's substance turns to rot. After learning now, you scan vain endeavors man by man. Do you mind that you as they once was held by mystic sway dreamed and struggled hoped and prayed lulled and with the minutes played sighed for honors battles planned sipped of cups that wisdom banned but would please the weak frail flesh suffered fell rose struggled fresh now that you are but a skull glimpse you life as life is full of beauties that we miss till time withers with his kiss do you laugh in cynic vein since you cannot try again and you know that we like you will too late our failings rue tell me ghoulish grinning skull what deep broodings o'er you mull tell me why you smirk and smile ere i pass life's sunset style end of section thirty three recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section thirty four of the book of american negro poetry this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Khalil B. The Book of American Negro Poetry. Edited by James Weldon Johnson. Appendix. Placido Sonnet to His Mother. De Pida a Mi Madre. En la capilla. Si sí, la suerte fatal que me acabió y el triste fin de mi sangrienta historia, al salir de esta vida transitoria deja tu corazón de muerte herido, bate de llanto. El ánimo afligido recobre su quietud. Moro en la gloria y mi plácida lira a tu memoria lanza. En la tumba su postrer sonido, sonido dulce, melodioso y santo, glorioso, espiritual, puro y divino, inocente, espontáneo como el llanto que ver tierra al nacer. Ya el cuello inclino, ya de la religión me cubre el manto. Adiós, mi madre, adiós. El peligrino. Farewell to my mother in the chapel. The appointed lot has come upon me, mother. The mournful ending of my years of strife. The changing world I leave, and to another in blood and terror goes my spirit's life. But thou, grief smitten, cease thy mortal weeping. And let thy soul her wanted peace regain. I fall for right, and thoughts of thee are sweeping Across my lyre to wake its dying strains, A strain of joy and gladness, Free, unfailing, all glorious and holy, Pure, divine, and innocent, Unconscious as the wailing I uttered on my birth, And I resign. Even now, my life, even now, descending slowly, Faith's mantle folds me to my slumbers holy. Mother, farewell. God keep thee, and forever. 
translated by William Cullen Bryant. Placido's Farewell to His Mother Written in the chapel of the Hospital de Santa Cristina on the night before his execution. If the unfortunate fate engulfing me, the ending of my history of grief, the closing of my span of years so brief, mother, should wake a single pang in thee, weep not. No saddening thought to me devote. I calmly go to a death that is glory-filled. My lyre, before it is forever stilled, breathes out to thee its last and dying note. A note scarce more than a burden-easing sigh. Tender and sacred, innocent, sincere, spontaneous and instinctive as the cry I gave at birth. And now the hour is here. Oh, God! Thy mantle of mercy o'er my sins. Mother, farewell. The pilgrimage begins. Translated by James Weldon Johnson. End of section 34. Recording by Khalil B. Section 35 of the Book of American Negro Poetry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chuck Williamson. The Book of American Negro Poetry. Edited by James Weldon Johnson. Section 35 Biographical Index of Authors Bohannon, Otto Leland, born in Washington, D.C., educated in the public schools in Washington. He is a graduate of Howard University, School of Liberal Arts, Washington, D.C and did special work in English at the Catholic University in that city. At present, he is engaged in the musical profession in New York. Braithwaite, William Stanley, born in Boston, 1878, mainly self-educated, a critic of poetry and the friend of poets, author of Lyrics of Life, the House of Falling Leaves, The Poetic Year, The Story of the Great War, etc. Editor and compiler of The Book of Elizabethan Verse, The Book of Georgian Verse, The Book of Restoration Verse, and a series of yearly anthologies of magazine verse. One of the literary editors of The Boston Transcript, Brawley, Benjamin, born at Columbia, South Carolina, 1882, educated at the Atlanta Baptist College, the University of Chicago, and Harvard University. For two years, he was professor of English at Howard University, Washington, D.C. Later, he became dean of Morehouse College, Atlanta, Georgia. Author of A Short History of the American Negro, The Negro in Literature and Art, A Short History of the English Drama, A Social History of the American Negro, etc. Now living in Boston and engaged in research and writing. Campbell, James Edwin, was born in Pomeroy, Ohio in the early 60s. His early life was somewhat shrouded in mystery. He never referred to it, even to his closest associates. He was educated in the public schools of his native city. Later, he spent a while at Miami College. In the late 80s and early 90s, he was engaged in newspaper work in Chicago. He wrote regularly on the various dailies of that city. 
he was also one of a group that issued the four o'clock magazine a literary publication that flourished for several years he died perhaps twenty years ago he was the author of echoes from the cabin and elsewhere a volume of poems carmichael waverly turner a young man who had never been out of his native state of alabama until several years ago when he entered one of the summer courses at harvard university his education to that time had been very limited and he had endured poverty and hard work his verses came to the attention of one of the harvard professors he has since published a volume from the heart of a folk he served with the 367th regiment the buffaloes during the world war and saw active service in france at present he is employed as a postal clerk in boston massachusetts carruthers james d eighteen sixty nine to nineteen nineteen born in cass county michigan student in northwestern university minister and poet many of his poems appear in the century magazine cotter joseph s jr eighteen ninety five to nineteen nineteen born at louisville kentucky in the room in which Paul Lawrence Dunbar first read his dialect poems in the South. He was precocious as a child, having read a number of books before he was six years old. All through his boyhood, he had the advantage and inspiration of the full library of poetic works belonging to his father, himself a poet of considerable talent. Young Cotter attended Fisk University, but left in his second year, because he had developed tuberculosis. A volume of verse, The Band of Gideon, and a number of unpublished poems, were written during the six years in which he was an invalid. Dandridge, Ray G. Born at Cincinnati, Ohio, 1882 educated in the grammar and high school of his native city. In 1912, as a result of illness, he lost the use of both legs and his right arm. He does most of his writing lying flat in bed, using his left hand. He is the author of The Poet and Other Poems. Davis, Daniel Webster, born in Virginia, near Richmond. For a number of years, he was a minister and principal of the largest public school in Richmond. He died in that city some years ago. He was the author of Way Down South, a volume of verse. He was very popular as an orator and a reader of his own poems. Debt, R. Nathaniel, born at Drummondville, Canada, 1882 graduate of the Oberlin Conservatory of Music. He is a composer, most of his compositions being based on themes from the old slave songs. His Listen to the Lambs is widely used by choral societies. He is director of music at Hampton Institute. He is also the author of The Album of a Heart, a volume of verse. Du Bois, W. E. Bearhart, born at Great Barrington, Massachusetts, 1868, educated at Fisk University, Harvard University, and the University of Berlin, for a number of years professor of economics and history at Atlanta University, author of The Suppression of the Slave Trade, the Philadelphia Negro, The Soul of Black Folk, John Brown, Dark Water, etc. He is the editor of The Crisis. Dunbar, Paul Lawrence. Born at Dayton, Ohio, 1872. 
died 1906. Dunbar was educated in the public schools. He wrote his early poems while working as an elevator boy. His first volume of poems, Oak and Ivy, was published in 1893 and sold largely through his own efforts. This was followed by Majors and Minors, Lyrics of Lowly Life, Lyrics of the Hearthside, Lyrics of Love and Laughter, Lyrics of Sunshine and Shadow, and Howdy Honey Howdy. Lyrics of Lowly Life, published in New York in 1896 with an introduction written by William Dean Howells, gained national recognition for Dunbar. In addition to poetical works, Dunbar was the author of four novels, The Uncalled, The Love of Landry, The Sport of the Gods, and The Fanatics. He also published several volumes of short stories. Partly because of his magnificent voice and refined manners, he was a very successful reader of his own poems and was able to add greatly to their popularity. Fawcett Jessie Redman. Born at Snow Hill, New Jersey, she was educated in the public schools of Philadelphia at Cornell University and the University of Pennsylvania. For a while, she was a teacher of French in the Dunbar High School, Washington, D.C., author of a number of uncollected poems and several short stories. She is literary editor of The Crisis. Hill, Leslie Pinckney, born at Lynchburg, Virginia, 1880. He was educated in the public schools at Lynchburg and at Harvard University. On graduation, he became a teacher of English and methods at Tuskegee. Author of The Wings of Oppression, a volume of verse. He is principal of the Cheney Training School for Teachers at Cheney, Pennsylvania. Holloway, John Wesley, born in Meriwether County, Georgia, 1865. His father, who learned to read and write in slavery, became one of the first colored teachers in Georgia after the Civil War. Mr. Holloway was educated at Clark University, Atlanta, Georgia, and at Fisk University, Nashville, Tennessee. He was for a while a member of the Fisk Jubilee Singers, has been a teacher and is now a preacher. He is the author of From the Desert, a volume of verse. Jameson, Roscoe C., born at Winchester, Tennessee, 1888, died 1918. He was a graduate of Fisk University. Johnson, Charles Bertram, born at Kaleo, Missouri, 1880. He was educated in the public schools of his hometown and at Western College, Lincoln Institute, and at Chicago University. He was a teacher for a number of years and is now a pastor of a church at Moberly, Missouri. He is the author of Songs of My People. Johnson, Fenton, born at Chicago, 1888. He was educated in the public schools and at the University of Chicago and Northwestern University. The author of A Little Dreaming, Songs of the Soil, and Visions of the Dusk. He has devoted much time to journalism and the editing of a magazine. Johnson, Georgia Douglas. Born in Atlanta, Georgia, 1886. She was educated in the public schools of that city and at Atlanta University. She is the author of a volume of verse, The Heart of a Woman and Other Poems. Johnson, James Weldon. Born at Jacksonville, Florida, 1871. He was educated in the public schools of Jacksonville, at Atlanta University, and at Columbia University. He taught school in his native town for several years. Later, he came to New York with his brother, 
J. Rosamond Johnson, and began writing for the musical comedy stage. He served seven years as U.S. Consul in Venezuela and Nicaragua, author of The Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man, Fifty Years and Other Poems, and the English libretto to Goyescas, the Spanish Grand Opera, produced at the Metropolitan Opera House in 1915. Jones, Edward Smythe attracted national attention about ten years ago by walking some hundreds of miles from his home in the south to Harvard University. Arriving there, he was arrested on a charge of vagrancy. While in jail, he wrote a poem, Harvard Square. The poem created a sentiment that led to his quick release. He is the author of The Sylvan Cabin. Jones, Joshua Henry, Jr. He is engaged in newspaper work in Boston, and is the author of a volume of poems, The Heart of the World. Margotson, George Reginald, was born at St. Kitts, British West Indies, in 1877. He was educated at the Moravian School in his district. He came to the United States in 1897. Mr. Margotson has found it necessary to work hard to support a large family, and his poems have been written in his spare moments. He is the author of two volumes of verse, Songs of Life and the Fledgling Bard and the Poetry Society, and, in addition, a large number of uncollected poems. Mr. Margotson lives in Boston. McClellan, George Marion Born at Belfast, Tennessee, 1860 Graduate of Fisk University and Hartford Theological Seminary Teacher, Principal, and Author He is the author of The Path of Dreams McKay, Claude Born in Jamaica, West Indies, 1889 such education as he gained in boyhood, he received from his brother. He served for a while as a member of the Kingston Constabulary. In 1912, he came to the United States. For two years, he was a student of agriculture at the Kansas State College. Since leaving school, Mr. McKay has turned his hand to any kind of work to earn a living. He has worked in hotels and on the Pullman cars. He is today associate editor of The Liberator. He is the author of two volumes of poems, Songs of Jamaica and Spring in New Hampshire, the former published in Jamaica and the latter in London. Moore, William H. A. Was born in New York City and received his education in the public schools and at the City College. He also did some special work at Columbia University. He has had a long career as a newspaper man, working on both white and colored publications. He now lives in Chicago. He is the author of Dusk Songs, a volume of poems. Nelson, Alice Moore Dunbar Born at New Orleans, Louisiana, 1875. She was educated in the schools of New Orleans and has taken special courses at Cornell University, Columbia University, and the University of Pennsylvania. Author of Violets and Other Tales, The Goodness of St. Rock, Masterpieces of Negro Eloquence, and The Dunbar Speaker. She was married to Paul Lawrence Dunbar in 1898. She has been a teacher and is well known on the lecture platform and as an editor. Rogers, Alex. Born at Nashville, Tennessee, 1876. Educated in the public schools of that city. For many years, a writer of words for popular songs. 
he wrote many of the songs for the musical comedies in which Williams and Walker appeared. He is the author of The Jonah Man, Nobody, and other songs made popular by Mr. Burt Williams. Shackelford, Theodore Henry, author of Mammy's Cracklin' Bread and Other Poems, and My Country and Other Poems. Spencer Ann, born in Bramwell, West Virginia, 1882, educated at the Virginia Seminary, Lynchburg, Virginia. She lives at Lynchburg and takes great pride and pleasure in her garden. Watkins, Lucian B., was born in Virginia. He served overseas in the Great War and lost his health. He died in 1921. He was the author of a large number of uncollected poems. End of section 35. End of The Book of American Negro Poetry. Thank you for listening.